Okay. Um, is this thing on? Can people at the back hear me? Yes? Somewhat? How about now? Okay. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I may like fall asleep during the talk because it's a long way from uh, Vancouver and I just arrived yesterday. But um, uh, I'm here today to talk about convex optimization, a, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. Um, so I'll just start by setting up some context. Um, so throughout all areas of science and engineering, there's this trend to just collect a lot of data. And this is, this is seen all over the place. We're just thinking about more and more data and what do we do with all this data. I was actually flying around North America la this last year doing job interviews and uh, some of the American Airlines, they don't have like movies in the plane. So there's only so many times you can watch Frozen before, you know, you... So I went to the bookstore and there was actually this book called Big Data on the best sellers list. So it's not just like people in this room who are talking about big data. It's actually like, you know, your mom could be reading this book because she sees it at the bookstore or something like that. So it's really going into like the mainstream. And the book sort of talks about many aspects of this big data puzzle. It talks about all these sort of different things, but today, of course, we're here to talk about machine learning. So, in theory, we can use all this data to do some pretty cool things. Um, there's been some wild advances in vision the last few years. That's sort of the one that really stands out, as well as speech recognition. But there's a whole bunch of places where we can use modern techniques. Um, but I think it's not just having big data to actually do these interesting things, we also need big models. We're talking about things that um, you run on big clusters or, or with GPUs, things like that. Things that have millions or billions of parameters. So we really want to think about high dimensional problems. Now at the core of a lot of the models that we're using is actually numerical optimization and sort of machine learning and numerical optimization have really fallen in love the past 10 to 15 years because they're so tightly knit. Where now optimization people are coming to machine learning conferences to present their advances there. And in optimization journals, they're now using machine learning applications in their, uh, as examples. One of the problems that arose initially in this collaboration is that black box optimization models don't really work that well for a lot of machine learning problems. This is often because the data is just too big and there's, there's quadratic or cubic time operators in there, or, or it's just too high dimensional. So why do we want to learn about optimization? Well, as I said, it's at the core of many machine learning algorithms, and it's also, it's machine learning itself is driving a lot of research in optimization. In this talk, I'm mostly going to talk about convex optimization, except for two slides. Um, and the, but, so I, sh I should give some justification for spending a few hours on this, when in fact, a lot of the models that we fit are not actually convex. So one of the reasons to talk about convex optimization is these are among the only efficiently solvable problems. These are, these are the, one of the largest classes of problems that we can still solve in, in w what you could define as polynomial time. You can also do a lot with convex models. There's things like least squares, lasso, generalized linear models, SVMs, CRFs. These are widely used tools and these are used for a whole bunch of things. Um, the other thing is that the empirically most effective non-convex methods, they're often based on methods that have good properties for convex optimization. So there's a few exceptions to this, but usually the non-convex methods, they're based on good convex principles. And we can also think of um, this property that once you're near a local minimizer, your function is going to look convex around the minimizer. So if your, if your non-convex method doesn't have good properties for, non -con for convex optimization, then it, it's not going to have so good methods for non-convex optimization either. So just to put it in context of where my research is, and, and this is sort of being driven by this problem that the existing methods can't really scale to huge problems, is instead of using a black box method, we're going to look at specific properties of the function and use those to design more clever algorithms. So a lot of the, the talk today is going to be sort of a laundry list of these specific things that you can think about. Um, but of course, once you have better optimization methods, you can actually think of better models. You can think of once you prove something about a general class of things, you can see what else is in this class, what else can I model with this class of functions. And of course, you can think about alternating between those two. So I'm going to go through five topics today. and. Um, can you remind me what the actual breakup of the time is? Yeah, 
Wow, okay, that's a really long morning. Okay. Um, okay, fair enough. Okay, so we're going to start from the very beginning. What actually is a convex function for the people who uh, have not seen this before or have maybe just seen it once? So this is the inequality here. Theta is some scalar value between 0 and 1. And we're saying that the function, if I take it halfway between two um, parameters, x and y, the function is actually below if I take what's called here a convex combination. So it's, it's a linear combination, but you have to go between 0 and 1. Uh, and a way to say that is that the linear interpolation, uh, the function is below the linear interpolation. So as a picture, we have some function f of x. I pick any two points, x and y, evaluate the function at f of x and f of y, and then I draw the line here. So this right side is actually that line, the line going from f of x to f of y. And then a convex function just says the function is always below that line. So here if I go halfway in between the two, I'm there, and the actual function is below that. So very simple definition. Um, I did this in class and people got annoyed at me. They were like, we saw this in high school, but it's good to, um, to still go over this carefully. And similarly, a non-convex function wouldn't satisfy that. So this function here, we do our linear interpolant and the function is actually above that, so we know that function is not convex. An implication of convexity is that any local minimum is also a global minimum. So, um, it's, you know, you, you can draw that on your own. You always end up drawing a dirty picture or something like that. Um, I'll let you do that on your own. Um, I'm also going to talk a lot about norms. So I'm hoping you've seen norms before. Um, if not, this is a ver very quick definition. So a norm basically satisfies these, these three properties that at zero, at zero, if you multiply your parameter vector x by a scalar theta, you just multiply the norm by the absolute value of theta and you have the triangle inequality. Um, the f of x plus y is less than or equal to f of x plus f of y. So the one we're most familiar with is the Euclidean norm, the square root of the sum of squares, um, which can also be written like that. Uh, another one that will come up a lot is the one norm, which is the sum of the absolute values. And then if we have a positive definite matrix H, we sometimes define this general quadratic norm in this way. And you can show that those all satisfy the nice properties. Um, and then there's a two-line proof that all norms are convex. So this, we're evaluating our function at this point. We use the triangle inequality to do that, and then we use property two, the homogeneity property, to take the theta and the one minus theta outside. So we just showed that any norm is, is a convex function. There's another uh, stronger definition called strictly convex. And all I've done is I've replaced the, the uh, non-strict inequality by a strict inequality. Um, and that just means you're strictly above the function. And replacing that with a strict inequality has, one, has an, an important implication. It means you have at most one global minimum. So if you have a convex function, you can have a whole set of local minimum. But strictly convex, you have to grow up. So you can't have um, more than one global, global minimum. Now, there's a couple other equivalent definitions of convexity that show up over and over again. So if you are differentiable, then an equivalent definition to convexity is that you satisfy this inequality. So you can view this as a linearization of f, and it says that f of y is always above the linearization. So that's much easier to understand as a picture, but um, you're going to see this quantity over and over again in the talk. So if you're writing stuff down, I, I would write that down because th that's going to show up on like, you know, one third of the slides. So start, maybe we'll just stare at this and uh, appreciate what this is after we've drawn the line here. So f of x, this black thing is our function. And then the green, I've drawn the right side there. It hits f of x exactly here. It agrees with the derivative, but then it's just a linear function, so it goes off. And the function is always above the green line. So that's a, a completely equivalent definition of, of convexity for, for differentiable functions. And so the, the, the function values are always above. If you're twice differentiable, there's yet another equivalent definition, which is if you take this matrix here, which is called the Hessian, we actually take the, the first and second derivative with respect to each variable. We construct that whole thing in a matrix. We call that a Hessian. 
If that matrix is positive semi-definite for all x, then the function is, is convex. Um, and roughly that means you're either flat or the function is curving upwards in every single direction in your high dimensional space. Is that, is that static coming from me? Or is that like construction going on outside? Okay. Um, okay, so a special class of functions in optimization is quadratic functions. They're in some sense special because they have closed form solutions. And at the same time, if you don't use the closed form solution, they're often actually the hardest function to optimize in the class of convex functions, which is, which is kind of weird. Um, okay, so at x transpose a positive semi-definite x plus b transpose x plus c, or rather, if we want it to be convex, we need a to be positive semi-definite. So if we take the derivative of this twice, we get that the Hessian is just a, and so this function is convex uh, if and only if a is positive semi-definite. If you're doing least squares instead, uh, you need a transpose a to be positive semi-definite, um, which, which again means just, um, so, and, and that actually is positive semi-definite by construction. So least squares is, uh, is always convex. So you can show that, um, that this will be, um, if, you, if you put x transpose x on each side, then, it, then it's, it's, the, it's the norm of ax. Um, so it's always positive. Some examples of convex functions. Um, if we use f of x equals c, just a constant. Constant function is, is trivially convex. Uh, we also have linear functions. So any line or hyperplane, things like that. They're actually both convex and concave. Um, if we have a quadratic function, ax squared with a greater than or equal to zero, I guess, that's convex. Uh, exponential of ax, um, this sort of negative entropy function. Um, if you take the Euclidean norm squared, that's also convex, and, and max of over convex functions is convex. Um, some other examples that show up in machine learning, this is called the log sum exponential. So if I take the log of the sum of a, the exponential of a bunch of values, it'll actually be convex in those values. Um, log determinant of x, or that might need to be negative log determinant, I can't remember. And then here's a weird one. If I do x transpose y to the negative 1x, where both x and y are parameters, that's also a convex function. And that, that seems like a really weird thing, but it does occasionally show up um, in machine learning applications. So basically what you do is, so for these, all the smooth ones, you just take the derivative twice, you check, you have to sh somehow show that it's positive. It's pretty easy. The max function, you, you can use the zero order, you use sort of a, a triangle type inequality to show that. But it's actually really easy to show that all these functions are convex. For more complicated functions, it's useful to know a set of uh, operations that preserve convexity. So this is a, a toolbox you have where you try and decompose your function into a sequence of operations that all preserve convexity. So one thing you can do is if you have two convex functions, f1 and f2, and you take non-negative non combinations theta1 and theta2, then that is a convex function. Another thing you can do is if f is convex, then ax plus b is also a convex function of x. Um, or if you take the maximum over convex functions, that's also going to be a convex function. So it's useful to, um, if you want to show something that's convex, it's useful to know these things, and that way you can show that more complicated things are convex. So let's think about this least residual problem. A is my data matrix, my design matrix, X is my parameters, B is my target vector. I'm doing regression in some P norm. So this could be the two norm, the one norm, the infinity norm, the three norm, whatever. Um, I can use these rules to show that this is convex. So on one of the very first slides, we showed that any norm is convex. And then we have f of ax plus b is convex for convex f. So we just showed that all of these problems are convex optimization problems. Uh, another example is SVMs. Um, so here, uh, the two norm squared is a convex function. This is a constant function. This is a linear function. We know that those are convex. If we take the max of convex functions, that's convex. And now I'm taking, if c is greater than or equal to zero and one half is greater than or equal to zero, then this is um, property one. We've got a non-negative weighted sum. 
So it looks like kind of a nasty function, but if you just use the rules and use some properties of basic functions, you can easily show that SVMs are convex. So um, that, that's sort of putting this more formally. I think the slides are on the web page up, up to some things I did this morning. So that's, that's sort of all I want to say about convex functions. There's a few more things you can say, and there's some more fancy um, operations that preserve convexity, like if you're doing compositions, sometimes that preserves, but sometimes it doesn't. But just using those simple rules and those basic functions, you can actually show that a lot of things you need to do um, are convex or that they're not convex. So let's move on to actually optimization. And the first thing we're going to talk about is smooth optimization. And to motivate that, I'm going to ask a question is, how hard is it to solve an optimization problem? So you give me some, actually, why don't I give you some generic function f. It's defined on r to the n, and you have to find the minimizer for me. How hard is this problem? I haven't made any assumptions about f yet. Does anyone know the answer to this? Does anyone have a guess? Can we solve this in polynomial time? No. How about exponential time? No. Can we solve this? No, you can't solve that problem. I can basically define a function that's constant everywhere and then take some arbitrary real value number and make it like minus infinity somewhere. And you'll never find that because it's, it's the same argument you get for showing like the real numbers are uncountable. You can, uh, you just keep on going out to the decimal expansion, whatever numbers you pick, I pick something different until you, until you can't find it. So to actually even start talking about optimization, we need to make some assumptions about the function. So I've mentioned convexity already, but we're actually gonna need something else. Um, and usually it comes in the form of some sort of Lipschitz continuous assumption. So one thing you can do is you can assume that the function f is Lipschitz continuous. What that means is the difference in the function value between two points x and y is less than or equal to some constant l times the, the distance between x and y. So it's saying that the function can't change arbitrarily fast. Drawing that as a picture, we have some function and some point, and L is gonna give me the, the slopes of two lines. And what, what this is saying is the function basically has to live in some area here once I know that point. So once I know the function value here, I know that the function has to live somewhere in this area or some in this area. It can't be like arbitrarily far down. And you can also think of this as generating an algorithm to solve the problem. So if I get a new point here, now I restrict the function even more and I can start to predict where the minimizer can actually be. You run into a problem though, is um, using only this information, there's actually a lower bound on how many function evaluations you have to do to solve the problem. And it looks like uh, one over t to the one over n. Um, this is very slow. So you can talk about uh, the representation of t and talk about like, um, you know, this, the, the one over t is not very good, but then you've got one over n, where n is the dimensionality of the problem, so that, that makes it even worse. So, it's, so for high dimensional problems, you, you can't really get a good solution. So this is saying that any algorithm under this assumption can't really solve this in this crazy exponential time. Um, one nice thing is if you want an algorithm that achieves this, actually some, some small variation of grid search that uses those constraints will actually achieve that. So we have the fastest possible algorithm under the Lipschitz assumption. It's just not very good. So the point of this slide is that optimization is hard, but the assumptions you make can actually make a big difference. So we went from impossible to something that takes a huge exponential factor. Okay, so we're gonna start talking about uh, problems that we can actually solve efficiently. So it's well known that if you have convex optimization problems um, with some restrictions, you can basically solve them in polynomial time by something called interior point methods. The issue, that, and the reason I'm not really gonna talk about those in detail, is that those usually require an n squared operation or an n cubed operation. So if you have n variables, um, you know, if n is small, that's fine, but I wanna solve problems with millions or billions of variables. So 
There, there, there may be ways to adapt these, but developing huge scale interior point methods is kind of still an open problem. So because of that, you know, there was all this interest in interior point methods because in the, in the 80s it was shown that these, this is the first class of method that has polynomial time solutions to linear programming. And then there was all these generalizations. Uh, but in the last few years we've gone back to actually um, gradient methods. So basic gradient descent. I have some parameter value x. I'm going to take the gradient of the function at that point and move along a small step size alpha in that direction. That gives me a new x plus. Now I define that as x, I do this again. So I've got my function, I'm taking the derivative, I just take a small step along the negative gradient direction, that's going to decrease the function a little bit. The reason we've gone back to these type of methods is that the cost of the iteration is O of n. At, at, at least ignoring, you know, the, the cost of calculating the gradient might be higher, but the cost of running the algorithm itself um, is O of n. So that's very nice. If, we, if n is like a billion, O of n doesn't scare me. If, if n is a trillion, you know, you have to think a bit. You may have to worry about whether thing is in memory or not, but you can do it. If n is, you know, if n is like a petabyte or whatever, you've got the cluster, you can do it. So whereas n squared, the scaling is much worse. The question is, what do we lose here? How many iterations do we need to actually solve the problem? So let's think of a standard machine learning problem, which is L2 regularized logistic regression. So I want to do binary classification. I've got a set of binary labels, bi, which are plus one or minus one. I've got features ai, measuring the, 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 the things I want to use to predict the bi. And this is a sort of standard model. Here we've got what's called the negative log likelihood. That's measuring how well I am at predicting the bi's given the ai's and my parameters x. And then we usually add this regularization term. I'm not going to talk about why you want to do regularization. Uh, in my class, I actually just say it's magic. And later in the course, I actually give four reasons why you should be doing this regularization all the time. But actually, the fifth reason came up because one of our assignments, we had a competition, which is to tune a, tune a neural network as good as you possibly can. And the, your mark was based on like what your test error was at the end. It turned out that they tried a whole bunch of fancy things. The thing that worked the best was to add this term to the code that I gave them and run it for a really long time. So that's, you know, fifth. So regularization is just magic and you should use it. Okay, so let's talk about this objective. First off, it's convex. So this term is clearly convex. This term, it may not be so obvious, but we can, we can, we can show that with our, with our operations. This is a linear function. If I write this as exponential of zero, this is the log sum of exponential. Um, so we've got log sum exponential, composition with affine mapping. Uh, the function is convex. The first term is actually Lipschitz continuous. The second term, which is supposed to be the really nice term, is actually not Lipschitz continuous. Quadratic function grows like this, whereas Lipschitz continuous, you're only allowed to grow linearly. So that's a sl slightly subtle point. Um, but we don't actually need the function to be Lipschitz continuous. We actually have much nicer properties. Is that if I take the Hessian, which is this guy, um, actually it's not quite that guy. It's, it's a transpose times some diagonal matrix times A plus lambda times identity. Um, I actually have that the eigenvalues of the Hessian are bounded between two positive constants. So L is an upper bound on how quickly the, the gradient can change. Mu, mu is a lower bound on how quickly the gradient can change. Um, so it's not actually that the function is Lipschitz continuous, it's that the gradient is Lipschitz continuous, and that's going to be actually a much more useful property. The red part that we have this lower round, it says that the function is strongly convex. So it's actually not just that it's, this is even stronger than strictly convex. It's not just that that holds with a strict inequality, but it actually holds by a certain amount. Um, and yeah, so it's stronger than strict convexity and it implies that a unique solution exists too. So, so strict convexity doesn't imply that a solution exists. Strong convexity does imply that a solution actually exists. So that's nice. So, why do I care? Why is Lipschitz continuous gradient important? 
So there's some variant on Taylor, Taylor's expansion that shows this property. So f of y is my function. These first two terms are the terms that I said will come up over and over and over again. That's, that, that's this line that's always below the function. Um, and then Taylor's expansion says that if I take this quadratic form and evaluate the Hessian for some value z, that this holds with equality. So there's some z that will let me curve up so that I actually hit, hit the function value as opposed to always go below it. And the Lipschitz continuous gradient said that the Hessian was always less than or equal to Li. So I can turn this equality into an inequality. So I know that this term here is always less than or equal to this term here um, from the eigenvalue properties. And this gives you a global quadratic upper bound on the function value. So let's draw that as a picture. We're at f of x, and those are the first two terms that we see over and over again. They, they give us our lower bound. And what that inequality says is actually if you add that extra term, you get an upper bound. Adding this extra term to the green line gives us a quadratic function. These two terms are 0 if y equals x, so it, it hits the function. It also agrees with the derivative at that point, but then it, the curvature, the second derivative, is set so that it's always above the function. So there's the function value. Um, and we're going to actually use this to get an algorithm. What we're going to do is we're going to think about moving to, to the minimizer of the, the surrogate function. So I'm going to compute this blue thing. I'm going to move to the minimizer of it, and that's going to give me an algorithm. And the algorithm roughly is going to look like this. So we're imagining a function here where the minimum is here, and it, it's sort of going up as it moves out towards you, this and this. You're at some x, and you want to generate x plus, and you do it by minimizing that surrogate function. You know that the surrogate is always above the function, so whatever progress you make uh, you're gonna, on the surrogate, you're going to make more progress on the original function. And it'll basically end up taking steps orthogonal to the level curves. And you sort of move inside these circles. You keep going until you eventually hit the, uh, the actual minimizer. So what that algorithm looks like is we're going to set x plus to the minimizer of the upper bound in terms of y. So I treat this blue thing as a function of y. It's a quadratic function. I can just take its derivative and set it to 0. Um, when I do that, I get this expression. And it looks like gradient descent. It is actually a special case of gradient descent. x plus is x minus step size times gradient. We've just set the step size to 1 over L by minimizing that quadratic approximation. If I plug that value back into here, into the right side, then I get um, this bound. So it's saying that the new point is less than the old point minus some value that's positive and depending on the gradient. So it's telling me, with this approach, as long as the gradient isn't 0, as long as I'm not at the optimal solution, this algorithm is guaranteed to decrease the objective every time I run the iteration. Um, we can apply the same argument going in the other direction with the strong convexity. So we have our Taylor's expansion, and now I'm saying that the eigenvalues of the Hessian are above some mu times i, so that's giving me a, a lower bound on the function. So same picture, except for I'm getting this red thing, and I know that the red function is always below the function. So we've now sort of squeezed the function between this blue upper bound and the red lower bound, and I can do this for any x you give me. Um, same argument. Uh, I minimize both sides of this in terms of y. Um, now, I, now I'm uh, getting f of x star here, and then I'm getting the same bound here, but in terms of uh, mu instead of l. And so this is telling you, telling you you can't be too far away from the solution as far as this function is concerned. And you can actually just put these two simple inequalities together to prove how many iterations you're going to need to solve the problem. So let's do that as a picture first. Um, this blue function tells me, based on the gradient there, I'm guaranteed to make at least this much progress on each iteration. Every time I run the algorithm, it gives me a bound saying I need, the function needs to be, are, are you making at least that much progress? The red line, the, the lower bound, gives you a maximum suboptimality. It's saying that the, the minimum of the function 
cannot possibly be below this because I know the red line is always below the function. Um, so that will be your next iteration. Um, and just putting these two bounds together, you just, you'll, you'll solve for the gradient in one of them, plug it into the other one, and then you subtract f of x star from both sides. Uh, you get something that looks like this. So f of x plus, my new function value, minus the optimal function value, f of x star, is less than or equal to what it was before I did the iteration, times this value 1 minus mu over L. Mu over L is always less than 1, so it's saying you're always getting closer to the solution. Um, and if you apply that recursively, so I did this on f of x plus and f of x, but now I, I take the whole inequality, I plug it in and replace this guy, so I'm getting 1 minus mu over L, 1 minus mu over L, and then like f of x minus minus f of x star, and I keep plugging it in over and over again, um, I basically raise this to the power of t. Um, this is called a, a linear convergence rate or a, a geometric convergence rate because it's related to a, a geometric sequence or a uh, exponential convergence rate. Uh, and I won't say why that is. It's, it's not very important. Um, so if mu over L is not very close to 1, this goes down very fast. So if mu over L is 0.9, or, or sorry, 0.1 even, then this is 0.9. You raise 0.9 to a power, that goes to zero very, very quickly. Um, so what I want to emphasize is this is actually a pretty good rate, especially if mu over L is not too close to one. What if I don't do the regularization? What if I don't have that magic part here? So it's, it's convex, so I still have this bound, but now I only have the bound I had before. I just have that linear bound instead of the quadratic bound. So in pictures, we still have the blue part, but instead of the red one, uh, we just have a linear function. And so this doesn't really tell us as much about x star. It tells us that it has to be on this side, but the green function could go down ex extremely low and far. So this is a much weaker um, statement. Um, I'm not going to show why. You can find uh, in various places, including I did a MLSS practical session a few years ago where we proved this uh, property. Um, but if some x star exists, then you get a convergence rate that, that looks like this. Instead of being uh, the, the geometric series, you get 1 over t. So the first, you have some constant value. After you run the, iter the iteration uh, once, you're at that value. Then you go 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, 1 over 5. So it's going to 0. But the longer you run it, sort of the less progress you make. So this is not as nice of a, of a convergence rate. But one thing I'll point out is when I talked about a general Lipschitz continuous function, we had 1 over t uh, to the negative 1 over n. So we're way faster than that super crazy exponential rate that I showed before. Um, in particular, this doesn't depend on how many variables you have. So I talked about doing gradient descent in the context of solving huge dimensional problems. Um, the, the dimension here doesn't show up anywhere. So, you know, up to its effect on mu and L, you can solve billion dimensional problems as fast as you can solve 10 dimensional problems, which is a very nice property if you want to solve billion dimensional problems. Um, a nice note is that whenever F is convex, if I just add this regularization term here, I make it strongly convex. So if you ever have a convex function and you want to optimize it a little bit faster, uh, your test error will probably go down too. Just add that function to make it strongly convex. Then you get a unique solution. It's much easier and will probably work better. OK, so some practical issues. That's sort of the, the theoretical properties. Um, you never actually use 1 over L when you implement the algorithm. There's always more clever things you can do. So one thing that you often do is you use something called a line search. So you have that step size alpha of how far you're going to go in the gradient direction. Usually you'll do some sort of search to try and find an alpha that decreases the function value a lot. So using 1 over L, you're, you're guaranteed to make that constant progress. But if you get lucky and you find a really good direction to search in, then you might be able to make much more progress. And the nice thing with the line search is 
you often don't need to actually know L to use them. So here's the most basic one you can think of, um, you know, four or five lines of code. It's called the Armeo Backtracking Line Search. You start with a big value of alpha. Alpha is your step size, how far you're going to go in that direction. Um, you check this inequality, um, and it's not really a coincidence that that kind of looks like the, the blue function, the upper bound, uh, for some gamma. And you can set gamma to be very small. Um, and once you satisfy that inequality, then it means you're, you're making some sort of guaranteed progress, um, and so you can just take that step. But usually you can use a much bigger alpha than if you just blindly set to 1 over L, because L may be very large. There's more fancy things you can do if you download someone's code. Um, they may talk about using something called the wolf conditions, and those make sure that, that the step size alpha doesn't get too small. Um, and rather than blindly dividing alpha in half, there's actually very clever ways to initialize the alpha or to try different sequences of alpha. So if you, if you tried an alpha and you found it was too big, you can actually look at the function and the gradient value, um, and then look at the function and gradient value you had before, and you, you can fit a little polynomial and move to the minimizer of the polynomial rather than assuming it's halfway in between the two or something like that. So actually good codes will use all these tricks, and usually you only have to try one or two uh, step sizes per iteration. Another practical issue is the number one reason if you download a code and it doesn't work, um, and I don't want to be mean, but the number one reason it won't work is because actually your gradient code will be wrong. And I'm not criticizing everyone in the room here because I'm including myself in this. This is the number one thing for me too. So really make sure your derivative code is correct before you, uh, before you try it out. So a lot of packages will give you the option, but you can also just use, use calculus, like the definition of the gradient. So you take some small step size delta. EI is just, you know, you change one coordinate. EI is just zeros everywhere with a one somewhere. Um, do the uh, sort of difference, and then that should be a good approximation. So you should always check your derivative code before you do anything, because if your derivative code is wrong, then obviously things aren't going to work well. You can't really do that for high dimensional problems, because there's too many, there's too many I's. There's too many partial derivatives to check. But if you're confident your derivative code is correct and you have a billion variable problem where the interaction is, is kind of hard, what you can do is you can check a, a directional derivative in some random uh, direction. And this is a, you know, my office mate in Paris just mentioned this one day and I've subsequently put it in my codes and I think it's, it's really clever. So the directional derivative in some direction d, just generate a random d and check this formula. This doesn't tell you as much as this, because this will actually tell you if you've got some of the partial derivatives right and some of them wrong. This will just tell you, like, right or wrong. But at, le at least then you know and you can check for, if, you know, maybe if your function behaves differently with a huge number of variables than with a small number, then it gives you some indication. So a lot of this, the, the remainder of the thing, we're going to talk about um, these, the ways you can get these sort of convergence rates. So we've talked about two convergence rates already. If you apply the gradient descent to a smooth and convex function, you get this 1 over t rate. And a smooth and strongly convex, you get the faster linear convergence rate. Um, I talked about this in the context of twice differentiable functions. But you can apply more or less the same argument with once differentiable functions. You just have to show that something that looks like those Taylor expansions still holds uh, for once differentiable functions, um, which is not, not completely trivial, but it's, you know, it's in the, the textbooks and so on. Um, a weird thing is that even though line search is quite common, it doesn't change the worst case rate. And I think this is a big difference between like, the theory and the practice. Because in practice, you should always do line search. But in, in the theory, you always take this nice 1 over L step size and use this model algorithm to analyze that. Um, you can, you, you can go a little bit faster using a step size that depends on mu, but I don't know if anyone actually does that. Um, there are ways to get a linear convergence rate um, without strong convexity. Um, Luo and Zhang, their work in the early 90s, looked at general error bounds where you can still get linear convergence even if you don't add that extra term. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that too much today. Get, it gets quite technical. But one, one thing I want to mention here is that even if you think you're in this case, you're often still in the linear convergence rate because your function has some special properties that you don't 
you don't know about or you're not considering. And, and we don't have a complete characterization of what you need to, to have. But the question I want to get to now is actually, you know, gradient descent, you don't really think of using it often because if you take the, um, you know, an undergrad scientific computing class, they'll talk about using uh, Newton's method and other things, uh, which, which brings high dimensional operations in. Um, but can we get a better algorithm under these assumptions um, that doesn't have a high dimensional scaling? And this is where something called Nestroff's uh, accelerated gradient method or optimal gradient method comes in. So instead of having an X, you have an X and a Y. Here's our gradient descent step on Y. We use that to assign that to X. And then we take Y as this weird combination of the two previous X values. Um, if, you, if you work on neural networks, it, it looks kind of like uh, what's called momentum. Um, or if you're familiar with the, the old optimization literature, it looks like something called the heavy ball method. Um, it's not exactly the same. Some of the indices are moved around, but it, it's, it's very similar. Um, the motivation for this, so the momentum and the heavy ball method, those come from like physics motivations and for quadratic functions you can show they have nice properties. Um, the motivation for this is often stated as, as to make the math work. Um, I guess conjugate gradient is also a, a sort of a, um, very similar to this algorithm. So when you do Nesterov's algorithm, uh, you can improve on these rates. So instead of getting 1 over t in the convex case, you get 1 over t squared. Um, which, which is quite nice. It's still sublinear. It still says that the longer you run it, the less progress you're going to make. But obviously, t squared grows much faster than t, so your error is going down faster. In the strongly convex case, you can take the square root of mu over l. And so since mu over l is less than 1, taking the square root makes it even smaller. Um, given these assumptions, 1 over t squared is actually optimal. So there's no, there's no faster rate you can achieve um, in the convex case. Um, and then this, this case is, is close to optimal. So that's sometimes called the optimal gradient method because under these assumptions you can't really go uh, any faster. Um, it's also faster in practice. So if you just compare gradient descent with 1 over L to Nestorov's method with 1 over L, Nestorov's method will work much better. But once you start taking into account like line search and clever initializations of the step size and all these things, then to me it's not as clear that um, it's probably just because gradient descent has been around for many, many more years. It's from the 1850s, I believe, whereas Nesterov's algorithm is from 1983, so people have had less time to tune it. But um, in practice, it's, it's not so clear that it necessarily works better. Um, okay, Newton's method is actually even older than gradient descent. Um, if you're in stats, you may have heard of something called iteratively re Reweighted least squares is the same as Newton's method, but you assume some, some form of the function's f. Um, the update looks almost the same. We still have our x, we still have a step size, but here, we, instead of getting the gradient here, we have some direction d, and d is the solution of this linear system. So if this wasn't here, if this was the identity matrix, then Newton's method is just the gradient method, but we're putting the Hessian here, and we're um, assuming it's positive definite and, and inverting it either explicitly or implicitly to compute D. Um, and this is kind of a second order version of gradient descent. So writing it in terms of the way we looked at gradient descent, we can write Newton's method as using uh, this approximation to the function. Our first two terms are the same as they always are. This is our actual function, a linearization of it. But then instead of having the, the Euclidean norm here, we have this general quadratic norm. So we're defining our distance based on the, the Hessian of the problem, that thing. Um, so notice it's not an inequality. Um, and you can generalize that the Armillo condition. So if you want to do line search, you just use the directional derivative. Um, and the nice thing about Newton's method is if you run it long enough, eventually you just start setting the step size to 1. So it's sort of got a natural scaling, that once you get close to the minimizer, the line search kind of turns off as long as you're trying a step value of 1 all the time. As a picture, uh, we're now using this orange approximation. So before we had the blue approximation, which we forced to always be above the function, the orange approximation can actually go below the function or it can be above the function. But the hope is that since the orange function agrees with the second derivative, 
at this point that it's probably a better approximation. So moving to the minimizer of the orange function might be a better guess uh, of where the true optimizer is than our blue function. So that, that's our guess in this case. Um, in 2D, it's maybe more clear to see why that's the case. So I've again drawn one of these bowls where the minimizer is here and we're going out of the whiteboard to visualize the function. We're at some iteration xk. Um, that's our norm normal gradient step. So these things here are called the level curves. Those are the, the areas where the function has an equal value. Um, and we always move orthogonal to the level curves. We move perpendicular to them when we do gradient descent. So we want to be going this way, but gradient descent is saying, well, you have to move orthogonal to the level curves. That works great if they're concentric, if these, if these curves are just circles. But when they're an ellipse, the more elliptical it is, the more this is a bad idea. So Newton's method, you can think of it as putting down this quadratic function q, this blue function. So the blue function is going to be the same at xk. It's going to agree with the first derivative, and it's going to agree with the second derivative at xk. And so instead of moving orthogonal to the level curves, we're actually going to be moved to the minimum of the blue function, and that's this x minus alpha d step. So we wanted to go here, and Newton's method is actually pointing us more in the right direction than, than the gradient descent method is. So that's for an intuition of why you can make much more progress with this strategy. To start showing properties of this, you need to assume, in addition to the gradient being Lipschitz continuous, you need the Hessian to be Lipschitz continuous, and then with our standard strong convexity, you get what's called a superlinear convergence rate. So instead of having a fixed value here, you have a value rho t, and rho t is going to converge to zero in the limit. So unlike the convex case, where I said the longer you run it, the less progress you make, with Newton's method, it's the opposite. The longer you run it, actually, the more progress you make, um, which is kind of nice. So whenever you can afford to do, do Newton's method, you probably should. The problem is it actually requires solving this thing, and th that can be quite expensive. Um, that's called the local rate. Um, in the last few years, there's been work on variations of Newton's method that get, give you global convergence rates, that wherever you start them from, they get a nice convergence rate like this. And those are called cubic regularization or accelerated Newton's method or, or self-concordant, if you look in the Boyd and Vandenberg uh, book. Um, OK, so we want to avoid computing uh, this quantity. We don't want to actually form this Hessian. That, that's a, D, it's a n squared size matrix. Inverting it might be n cubed. We really don't want to actually do that. So there's a whole bunch of tricks that people have done to try and approximate that. So, okay, first trick we have to watch out for is the Hessian needs to be positive definite. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways you can try and modify it. Um, but you don't really want to be computing the Hessian every iteration. So one thing you can do is only compute every m iterations. Uh, that still doesn't make me happy because you still have to store it in, and, uh, and, store it and uh, invert it once. Um, you can only use the diagonals of the Hessian. Um, that sort of went out of style when people found better things to do, but it's gone, come back into style uh, because people are working on a lot of problems with, uh, with text data, which is very sparse. And in that case, you can, uh, you can usually get the diagonals and that they'll work quite well. Uh, but if you can afford it, there's, there's better things to do, such as uh, quasi-Newton methods. So instead of computing the Hessian, these methods, um, they store an approximate matrix, and in each iteration, they look at the difference in, in uh, parameter and gradient values, and they use that to update the approximation. And the approximation will just get better as you go along. Um, so there's the classical ones actually require storing a matrix, but the more recent ones either do that implicitly or they store it as a diagonal plus low rank matrix, so it doesn't require anything more than linear memory. And LVFGS is the most popular one. It works really well. And, um, if, if some of you, uh, you, you know, I know most of you have probably switched to Python or Julia or more fancy things, but if people are using MATLAB, um, I have a code uh, minfunc, uh, which, which is quite widely used, and the default options use something called LBFGS, and a lot of people find that works quite well as sort of a black box solver. Um, another nice trick you can do is called Hessian free or truncated Newton or Newton CG methods. So here you recognize that I can actually compute this product, the Hessian times a vector, without explicitly computing the Hessian. Um, and it more or less relies on either a nice form for the particular problem you're working on, 
or using uh, a simple calculus formula. So this, this is actually the, the uh, derivative in that direction. And you'll notice that it just depends on the gradient plus some perturbation delta times the direction d you want to go uh, minus the, the gradient. So if I just evaluate the gradient twice, I can get a very good approximation of the Hessian times a vector. Um, that doesn't really help you because you want to get the inverse uh, here. Uh, but what you can do is you can use something called the conjugate gradient algorithm, which requires these steps. And then you apply conjugate gradient with these operations to approximately solve that Newton system. And that's a very popular approach. Um, but if these things are too complicated for you, here's a trick that works really, really well. So if you have a gradient descent step, like you have a 20 minute break coming up shortly, just try this step size. It's another thing that I would just call magic. So in, in our class, you know, I, I set something up so that you, you had a basic gradient descent step and then you applied a few tricks. And this might bring the iterations from like 10,000 down to 70 or something ridiculous like that. It works really well. Um, it's motivated from the same perspective as quasi-Newton, but it, it's just, all it does is change the step size to act like a quasi-Newton method. And this was actually 1988. This is a you know, relatively recent method in the, the optimization world. Um, and then there's nonlinear conjugate gradient, but that, that's not so popular, not, or not as popular anymore. Okay, so that's really classical optimization I've just talked about. So if you've taken a course uh, that uses like the book of Nocidal and Wright, you've probably heard like almost everything I said, except for maybe like the global bounds, things like that. Um, so the next three sections are really about uh, what's happened like since the stuff in the textbook. So these are things where um, people always ask me for, for the reference and I say there is no textbook. Um, Vertsikis actually just came out with a new book which is going to cover a lot of the things in section three and four. And his book from the 80s covers a lot of what's in section five, although people are rediscovering it and improving on it now. Um, so smooth optimization is very nice, but once you go to non-smooth, or once you go to problems where you say, I can't even compute the gradient one time, or I can only compute the gradient 10 times, what do I do? So the, the methods that I just described are not good in situations where you can only compute the gradient 10 times. Um, and as we'll see, for non-smooth optimization, the natural generalizations are also quite bad. So I, I would say like the, the main motivator for the recent work in non-smooth optimization started with, with problems like this. I want to minimize a smooth function f plus the L1 norm of the parameter vectors. Um, the, the first application was called the lasso or basis pursuit denoising, where I have a least squares objective and then I have the L1 norm. The L1 norm has some of the magic properties that L2 regularization does. It's still going to make your, your test error better. Um, it's still going to have nice geometric properties and so on. Um, but the other property it has is it encourages sparsity in X. What that means is it's going to try and make the x value set exactly to zero. So this, if you do L2 regularization, that's not going to happen unless your, your column A is exactly zero or you get some weird cancellation or something. With L1 regularization, it actually prefers things being zero as opposed to very small. The reason that's nice is if you imagine what this A times x vector is doing, so each column of A is, is all the values of one of my features. And when I multiply it by x, I multiply my, my row times my vector. And so if, if that value is 0, whenever I look at that row, it's ignored. So it effectively ignores the rows of A. And it's kind of doing some sort of feature selection. It's not really the best way to do feature selection. The best ways are actually non-convex. But this is probably the best way if you're sticking to, to convex objectives. And the nice thing is it's... Um, it's more likely to include an irrelevant variable than exclude a relevant variable. So it, it'll sometimes give you false positives, but if this sets something to zero, the variable probably really is irrelevant and you don't need to like extract it in the future. The reason why this is interesting is the, the one norm is the sum of the absolute values. The absolute value is this linear function that hits zero and then has this non-differentiability at zero. So it's actually not differentiable. It's not smooth when xi is equal to zero. 
So this leads to the question, how can we solve uh, non-smooth convex optimization problems? And there have been a lot of papers written just on specialized methods for this, but it, it actually has led to a general theory of how we can do these things. First, before I get into those nice methods, I'm going to talk about sort of the first natural method you might think to do. And it, it in, is in some sense an optimal method. So here's our linearization of the function, the formula that we see repeatedly. Um, for non-smooth functions, this thing might be satisfied when I replace the gradient by some other vector d. Um, and we call that a subgradient. So a subgradient is basically any vector that satisfies this inequality. Uh, and we can draw that as a picture. So I have a non-smooth function here. If I'm at f of x, it turns out the, the only function, the only d that's going to satisfy that is the gradient itself. So subgradients are, are really a generalization of gradients in that if you, if you compute the subgradient of a smooth function, you just get the gradient. When I'm at the non-smooth point where there's a kink, something different happens. So you might think that the subgradient is, is something like that, and, and this will satisfy the inequality. It hits the function here, uh, it goes below it, that satisfies the properties we want. But when you're at a non-smooth point, you can find other, f other uh, vectors that will satisfy that, so other, other directions d. And it turns out there's a, there's a whole bunch of them. There's, a, there's actually a convex set of subgradients at any point. So if f, of, f is differentiable, uh, if and only if the, uh, the gradient is the only subgradient at that point, uh, and then at non-differentiable points, you have a set of subgradients, uh, which you usually call the subdifferential. And kind of weird notation is they use the partial symbol times f of x to denote this set containing all the subgradients. Um, you have this nice property that, for smooth functions, uh, to be optimal, to be or stationary, you need the gradient to be equal to zero. Uh, for non-smooth convex functions. If zero is inside the subdifferential, that means you're a, a global minimizer. And that, that's an if and only if statement. So let's look at the absolute value function. So if I'm positive, it, it's just one. If I'm negative, it's minus one. And then at zero, it, it's, it's that whole range. So that's the, that's the non-interesting case. The interesting case is at zero, where you have you know, minus one is there, plus one is there, zero is there. So notice that this is the global optimum of the function, and the zero direction is part of the subdifferential. So we know that that's the global optimum. And then you've got a whole bunch. So all, all those directions give you subgradients. Um, this is actually a special case of a more general, um, well, sort of, is the subdifferential of the max of convex functions. So I want to take the subdifferential of max. So think like SVMs, where you take like, like the max of zero in a linear function. Um, and, and the modern SVM solvers are often based on this idea. So if, if function one is bigger than function two, just take the gradient of function one. If function two is bigger than function one, take the gradient of function two. If they're equal, that's the interesting case. That's where you've got a kink, because the two functions have sort of met somewhere, and now you, you can't decide between them. You can actually take any linear combination of their gradients to get a subgradient. So the, 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 um, the expression for subgradients is kind of weird. It may seem like it's coming out of nowhere. But usually, actually getting a subgradient is very easy. So here's the subgradient method. Um, it falls in our standard framework. We're going x minus alpha times some direction d. And we're just going to say d is going to be some element of that subdifferential. I'm just going to take some subgradient. You might ask the question, well, what is the best subgradient to take? And if you want to decrease the function the most, you know, or the direction that decreases the most, um, it has this interesting relationship to the, um, it's called the minimum norm subgradient. So you, you take the d element of the subdifferential with minimum norm. And that, in some sense, gives you the steepest descent direction for a non-smooth problem. That's often hard to compute. Um, getting a subgradient is easy. Getting the minimum norm subgradient is not so easy. But if you do something like L1 regularization or some non-smooth separable function, getting the, the steepest descent direction is often easy. Um, if you don't take the steepest descent direction, you actually might increase the objective function. So if I'm, if I'm doing the L1 function, the minimum norm subgradient is just the zero. It's not very interesting. You won't go anywhere. But if you take any other subgradient, it's going to move you away from zero. 
So um, that, that's a problem with this method. But you can show that if alpha is small enough, the distance to the optimal solution, the distance between x plus and x star is going to be less than or equal to x minus x star. So even though you may not be dec decreasing the function value, if your step size is small enough, you can always decrease the distance to the solution. But because you're not um, decreasing the function value, you actually need your step size to go to zero. Um, another weird thing I should mention is that um, there are counterexamples showing that the, the steepest descent may not converge if you do line search. It's, it's kind of weird. So I'm not, I don't want to talk too much about subgradients, but I'll, I'll mention that a lot of the practical implementations either average the iterations or they average the, um, the, the gradients. And that's called, the averaging the gradients is called dual averaging. These things actually make it work much better, but in general, you should avoid using subgradient methods if you can. So how fast is it? Um, for convex, um, it's a little bit slower. You go from 1 over t to 1 over square root of t. So remember, we had, we had 1 over t squared with Nesterov, so now we're going in the opposite direction. We've now got a slower rate. Uh, for strongly convex, I think the situation is a bit more grim. Um, we've gone from linear convergence to actually a, a sublinear convergence. We went back to 1 over t. Um, and so that's, that's probably not very good. There are other black box methods for non-smooth optimization. So you've probably heard of cutting plane methods and bundle methods. These were made popular um, by S, uh, in the context of SVMs, I guess. Um, those do some more clever things like minimizing an approximation that uses all your previous subgradients. Um, but in the worst case, those actually don't improve on the convergence rate. So those are, they're still as slow as the subgradient method, even though they work a bit better in practice. Um, and there's also bad news. So, the, so these have the same rates, and it's because the subgradient method is actually the optimal black box non-smooth method. There's no um, first order method that doesn't have a high dependence on the dimensionality that, that can go any faster. Uh, and this isn't like a p equals np issue. This is like an information theoretic thing. There's, there's no, there's, there's, there's in some sense no hope here. Um, but the reason why we haven't just given up on non-smooth problems is we often don't really have a black box. You often know some extra properties of your function. You usually know a little bit more, and when you know a little bit more, you can do a bit more to try and go faster. And so I don't know what the right name for this is, but people have sort of converged on using structure in the objective function to get faster rates. So I'm really going to emphasize um, in the next few slides some of the methods that people have done to do this, and um, I really want to emphasize that the subgradient method is a really bad method, and the methods that are coming up will work substantially better. So even though there's no hope for a black box method, you're never going to see a code on someone's web page that you can just download and it's going to solve non-smooth problems very fast. If you look at your problem a bit more, um, you can do, you can go substantially faster. So I guess, I guess eventually the code that will be on people's web page will actually try and decompose your, your function somehow to exploit properties and to actually make a faster black box method. Okay. So the first you, thing you would think of is, well, I just said that non-smooth is hard and smooth is easy, so let's just replace the non-smooth function f with some smooth approximation f epsilon. And then let's apply our good methods for smooth optimization. Why do we have to do the subgradient method? So a very old one in the case of L1 regularization is this called this, um, I think it's called the multi-quadric function. So you, you approximate the absolute value with x squared plus some small number here and take the square root. Um, and what that function looks like is almost exactly the same as the absolute value function. It's nearly identical out here. And then it's, instead of hitting this kink here, it's got a small smooth part there. Um, it destroys the sparsity. You no longer get sparse solutions, but it's, it'll set things very close to zero still. Uh, you'll still get the regularization effect. Um, you can also do smooth approximations to the max function. So there, there's a few of them, but one of the most common ones is um, if I want to take the max of a and b, I take the log sum exponential function of a and b. That, that will approximate the max, and it's also um, called like soft max and things like that. Um, or maybe you want to design something specifically for your problem. So if you're doing SVMs and you have the hinge loss, this function that's zero everywhere and then has a kink and goes up as a linear line, you can just replace the kink with a small quadratic part, and that's called the Huberized SVM. 
Um, and that, that gives you much nicer optimization properties. There's actually a generic smoothing strategy. Um, so you, you end up having to take the, the convex conjugate, you apply a strongly convex regularizer in the dual, and that will actually give you a um, smooth approximation of the primal. It's a little bit involved, but if, if you have a function where you have absolutely no idea how to do it, uh, this, this strategy is available. So how does that do? So if I take my non-smooth function and I smooth it, I replace it with a smooth approximation, so I'm in this setting, and I want to get to this setting, what happens is um, you can't improve the rate in the worst case. The gradient method still has this 1 over square root of t rate. So it seems like we've done something really clever by replacing our non-smooth function with a smooth function, but in fact, that smooth function is going to be harder to optimize than a general smooth function, so you, you still lose the rate. But the reason why this got a lot of attention is Nesterov showed that if you used his algorithm, his faster algorithm that has the 1 over t squared rate, uh, then you can improve to 1 over t. Um, so that, that's nice. You're using the more fancy algorithm, and you're solving it as fast as you can solve smooth problems. So I think that's a really cute result. Of course, that's the theory. In practice, you're probably not going to apply Nesterov's algorithm. In practice, you'll do your smooth approximation, and now, you, now you've got a smooth function, and you use the fancy methods like LBFGS or nonlinear conjugate gradient or Hessian free or, or whatever you like. Um, there's a closely related result um, if your function is a saddle point problem. So if you want to take the min over x of the max of a set of functions, uh, you can also get up to the 1 over t rate using something called the mirror prox uh, method. Uh, and there's, there's also a method by Chamble and Pock that sort of addresses that same case and can, can give you um, 1 over t squared rates under some strong convexity and, uh, and linear convergence rates under some very strong convexity <laughs> assumptions. Another trick you can do, and this is what people first did for the L1 problem besides smoothing it, is try and rewrite your non-smooth problem as a constrained problem. So that's our original problem, and there's various ways to do it, but I particularly like this way of doing it. So I'm going to take my original variables x. I'm going to replace them with some variables x plus and x minus. And the idea is, if, you're, if your function is positive, if your variable x is positive, then x plus is going to be positive and x minus is going to be zero. Whereas if your original variable x is negative, then x minus is going to be positive and x plus will be zero. So you've sort of doubled the number of variables. Um, under that representation, your original function is just x plus minus x minus. So that has changed things a little bit. Uh, but then the L1 term turns into just x plus plus uh, xi minus. So you can show that this has the same solution. And, and there's a few other ways to do it. So there's this. Um, these things, this is based on the, the, the epigraphs, I guess. So those are, those are other ways of doing it. They all more or less involve increasing the number of variables to turn it into a smooth problem. Um, there, there are some problems with that, but um, the point I want to emphasize here is that um, general constrained optimization problems are kind of in the same framework as non-smooth problems. You can, you, can, you can do these tricks and apply interior point methods and solve them in polynomial time, for, for small dimensions, but for huge dimensions, they're not so nice. But if we have a function where we have what's called simple constraints, so in all these cases, we have some constraints, but they're actually not very complicated. I just need the variables here to be greater than or equal to zero. Here I need some to bound the other. Here I need the, the one norm to be less than some value. Um, those, are, those are called simple constraints. Um, and, and I'll say how we can um, maybe try and give a definition to that. But the point I want to get at is we have nice methods for optimizing smooth functions with simple constraints. So there's our, our gradient descent method. We wrote it as the solution of this problem. And I, I guess I've explicitly put in the step size alpha. That's where it'll show up when you interpret things in this way. Um, if you want to minimize subject to simple constraints, this, this, is, this is that blue function. All I have to do is minimize that blue function, that, that function, the, the quadratic approximation, while satisfying the constraints. So it's kind of almost like incredibly obvious in hindsight. You, you have this 
approximation that's always above the function. You want to minimize the function. Let's just make sure the approximation satisfies the constraints. Um, that's equivalent to a, an old algorithm from the 60s originally called uh, pro projected gradient descent. So you, you take your x, you do your gradient step, and let's call it xgd, x gradient descent. But, in, but that ignores the constraint. So to take into account the constraints, you minimize the distance, you find the point y that's closest to x that satisfies your constraints. And this, this thing is called the projection, and I'll show, show a picture in a moment. Um, but first I just want to say, we have sort of converged on this definition of a simple function as a function where it's easy to solve, or simple constraints, as constraints where it's easy to solve that problem. So let's look at a simple case. I have variables x1 and x2, and I want them to not be less than or equal to zero. So I want x1 to be, to be positive or zero, x2 to be positive. So you have to live in this blue region. I want to minimize the function subject to that. I'm at some function xk. If, if I'm not on the boundary, then, it, then in principle, you can just move within the set. But when you're at the boundary, that's where interesting things happen. So I take my gradient to step. I'm moving perpendicular to my curves. And now I compute the projection. So I'm at this point. I want to find the closest point inside this blue region to that point. And it turns out it, it's right here. Uh, it's sometimes called the, the orthogonal projection because it'll actually be orthogonal to the, the boundary of the set. And then I'm going to take my iteration as moving towards that point. So instead of moving here, I'm going to move just straight down. It keeps me inside the set. You can show that it's always going to make uh, an angle uh, less than uh, 90 degrees with this, so it's always moving inside the circles. It always decreases the objective function. Um, okay, so for what problems can we compute that? So I just showed in the last slide that if you just want things to be greater than or equal to zero, well, what is this doing? What happens is x1 became negative, and so after I took my step, I just set x1 to zero. I, ju I just clipped it at the point where it went past the boundary of the constraints. So if I want... Um, to compute the projection onto what's called the non-negative orthant, the projection onto uh, vectors with non-zero values, whenever they're below zero, I just set them to zero. So that's an easy one. Um, if you have lower and upper bounds, it's the same thing. If, you're, if they're below the min, you set them to the min. If they're above the max, you set them to the max. Uh, very easy, very intuitive thing to do. You would probably try doing it anyways if you want to solve these problems. Uh, if you have one linear constraint, or, or a small number of linear constraints, you can just compute the, the projection from your linear algebra textbook. Um, and there's a generalization to that if you have an inequality constraint, um, where you just, you just check if it's satisfied. If it's not satisfied, you use the, the projection onto the hyperplane. Um, projection onto the two norm is easy. You just scale things by, by the actual norm. Um, in the case of the one norm, there's actually a randomized linear time algorithm to compute that, um, more or less based on median finding ideas. Um, if you're on the probability simplex, the same thing. So if your variables have to be probabilities, there's a linear time algorithm to compute the, uh, the projection there, too. If you're not in one of these simple cases, but you have an intersection of these cases, there's something called Dijkstra's algorithm. And this is Dijkstra, not the uh, Dijkstra path guy, but a, a different Dijkstra. It's, it's spelt differently, too. But it's, uh, there, there's actually two famous Dijkstra's algorithms that people in, people in stats think the other one is the main one. Um, OK, so what do the convergence rates look like? These are basically all the rates that I've shown already for the, the, the smooth, unconstrained case. If I do the projected versions of these algorithms, I get the exact same rates. So I think it's nice to like pause, step back, and, and appreciate this. That if I have this you know, nice solver for smooth problems, it has this like, great convergence rate, it works well in practice, but now I've got this like, stupid constraint that my variables have to add up to one, or they have to be non-negative, or something like that. Um, with, the, with, in principle, a small modification, modif modification of the algorithm, I can now solve those constraint problems. So what I want to say is simple constraints are actually generally fairly easy to deal with. 
Uh, you can do a lot of the same tricks. There's Armeo line searches, there's fancy polynomial interpol interpolations, there's quasi-Newton, Barzilai, Borwin, and so on. The only place you get stuck is if you want to do the Newton-like methods and you don't have a, um, if you don't have a, um, a diagonal Hessian. Because there you need to actually project under this other norm instead of the Euclidean norm. So even if your set, your constraints are simple with respect to the Euclidean norm, they're basically never simple with respect to this general quadratic norm. So even if you just want your variables to be greater than or equal to zero, um, computing the step might be very expensive. Um, but in fact, you don't actually have to compute the projection exactly to get these convergence rates. Uh, and I'll talk more about that shortly. So that was nice, but there's a, there's a problem with that approach. So if I think about that, I'm used to having a whiteboard when I lecture, and I usually just go off on tangents, but maybe it's, it's good because there's only one lecture. You can't come back tomorrow and get the rest of the story. Um, so when I did the x plus and x minus thing, it seemed really nice. I converted it into a problem where I now have a fast convergence rate. I went from this subgradient method where I have these worst case uh, sublinear rates, this one over square root of t, I converted it to this, this other method, which, which is very nice, has a nice convergence rate. But sometimes you lose something when you do that. And it's not just because you doubled the variables. For example, if f was strongly convex, the transform problem is not strongly convex by construction. If, if you make out its Hessian, you basically get like, you know, a transpose a, a transpose a, minus a transpose a, minus a transpose a. The problem is, these rows are just the, the sign flip of those rows, which means it has zero eigenvalues, so it can't be strongly convex. So by doing that transformation, it, it seemed like we won, but the problem is we, we in some sense, made the problem harder. Um, so this is, uh, I don't know if that's specifically the motivation for this class of methods, but that's the motivation I'm going to use for something called proximal gradient methods, which will actually generalize the projected gradient methods. So these methods address problems that look like this. I have a general smooth f, and I have a simple convex function r. r doesn't have to be smooth. r can be non-smooth. r can even be infinity somewhere. As long as it's convex and it's not infinity everywhere, uh, what I'm saying is going gonna, is gonna to hold. So r can be very general. And for our purposes, you can think of r being the, the L1 norm or something like that. Here's the proximal gradient algorithm. We take our gradient descent step on f, on our smooth function, f. And then we solve this problem. So it looks kind of like the projection, but it's not quite the same. We're finding a y that's close to our gradient descent step, but that also is making progress on our non-smooth part, r. And the first maybe like year or two I looked at this, I have no intuition for it. And I still am not going to give you a great intuition for it but it works really well. So here's, the, here's almost the best intuition I can give you. These three terms here, this is where we got gradient descent from, gradient descent on f. So these, these terms are doing our, our quadratic approximation of f, and then we just add r to that approximation exactly. So we keep r the way it is, and we approximate f. And maybe I'll say that one, one more time. We're approximating the smooth part with this, this sort of Taylor expansion type of thing. And then the, the non-smooth part, we're not even approximating. We're just going to minimize that exactly uh, because we know that it's, it's going to be simple. And in this context, we define a simple R as an R where you can solve this problem efficiently. Um, when you do that, the convergence rates are still the same as for minimizing F alone without the R there. So in particular, if f is strongly convex, and we, we use that trick to turn it into a constrained problem, then we have to go solve, then we have the convergence rate of the convex problem. In this case, if f is strongly convex, we apply this algorithm, we get the linear convergence rate. We get the fast rate. So it's kind of a, kind of a, a subtle difference, but, but the point I want to make there is if you can directly solve the non-smooth problem with a nice method, then it's probably better than going the indirect route. OK. Ever, can you hear at the back? OK, good. Um, OK, so I hope you all enjoyed your break and thought about your favorite non-smooth problems and figured out if th this sort of thing applies to them, or at least you made plans for grabbing beer afterwards, one or the other. 
Um, okay, so the point I ended off at is this proximal gradient algorithm kind of assumes that computing the gradient and computing the proximal operator have roughly the same cost. Is this on? Can I turn this off? Why am I getting feedback? Easily testing. Okay. Um, Okay, um, but often uh, the gradient is actually much more expensive. So that could be because your, your data set is really large or your data fitting term might be complex. You might be fitting a graphical model or propagating stuff through a neural, neural network or whatever. Um, this is particularly true for structured output prediction when you're, at, when you're analyzing text or sequences or images, so things like that. Okay, great. Are we still okay at the back? Great. Okay, so think about fitting a, a conditional random field. So this is, instead of trying to predict one plus minus variable, you're trying to um, translate a French sentence to English sentence because you need to you know, pay your taxes or whatever. So in that case, our regularizer is typically still the L2 norm, L1 norm, something simple. But now this term here is going to be uh, still smooth, but very expensive to evaluate. Um, and it could be expensive just because the number of training examples n is very large. So I would argue that this is, this is sort of different than classic optimization like linear programming. So when you do linear programming, often your constraints are pretty complicated. They have some nasty thing there, but your function is just like A transpose X, something really simple. Um, so to, to make better methods for this type of problem, we're gonna take our inspiration from the smooth case. So I mentioned LBFGS is a very nice smooth algorithm. Um, we're gonna try and adapt that algorithm to this scenario. So the gradient method for optimizing a smooth F looks like that. And I mentioned Newton-like methods, which we can write in this form as just replacing the gradient by a scaling by the Hessian matrix here, or its inverse, approximating the second derivatives of that. And so LBFGS is just one way to choose the H there um, using gradient differences, and it has some nice properties. Um, and so as a picture, I think I drew this already, is we're moving to in this direction of the, the minimizer of this quadratic. Okay, so that's our proximal gradient method. It looks kind of like our gradient method, but we've surrounded our gradient method with this proximal operator. So the first thing you think of doing is, well, I know how to go from gradient to Newton's method in the smooth case, Maybe I'll just try this exact same thing in the non-smooth case. And you try it out. And on the first few iterations, it works really well. And so you're very happy. And then it doesn't work. It gets stuck. Okay, so why does it get stuck? Here's the case I was looking at before. That was our gradient projection step where we wanted our variables to be non-negative. Okay, let's put down our Q function as with Newton's method. We're gonna move to the minimizer of that. That's what this inner term here does. Now we're gonna compute our projection. What's wrong? Yeah, we want it to go up. Our projection is there, or sorry, we wanna go down, and this is taking us up. We always wanna go inside the circles, this is taking us outside. So it's actually pointing us in the exact opposite of the direction we wanna go. So you know, methods that find maximum directions of increase are not usually what we want if we're minimizing. So there are some cases where we can actually make that work, um, where you can modify the function h to actually make that work. So if you just have bound constraints or probability constraints or L1 regularization, uh, there's something called two-metric gradient or subgradient projection methods, where basically you make the, the you find that the um, variables that are gonna give you trouble, and you set all of their rows and columns to be zero on the off diagonals, and you can, you can make it work. Um, but in general, that doesn't work. So for L1 regularization, it works. For group L1 regularization, that's not gonna work. But I just wanna say that it, it, it's worth thinking about this. So this is the first numerical result I'm gonna show, because the first part of the talk was really about classical stuff and things, things that are obvious, whereas this may be less obvious. So this is an L1 regularization problem. And these are sort of all the methods that you were reading about a few years ago. So we've got, we've got Nestor's method, we've got projected proximal method, diagonal scaling, whatever. And you know, if, if you plot out to here, there is some difference between them, but they eventually kind of are getting the same performance. And then this red line, you know, we're minimizing, so lower is better, 
it, it kind of is orders of magnitude faster. And this is one of those two metric uh, projection algorithms. So for hard problems, they really make a difference. And so it motivates us to think if we can get a more general strategy. So that's our broken proximal Newton's method, where we have this here, and that's our prox operator. Um, there's, in principle, a simple fix to that, um, which is to change the prox operator so that you're pro computing the prox operator under a different norm. So I mentioned these quadratic norms. If you compute your proximal operator under that other norm, then it, it's just magic again. You get all the nice properties of Newton's method and so on. So you can think of this as a non-smooth Newton-like method. It seems very nice. You can get super linear convergence properties as you approach the solution. You get the, all, all the nice things. The problem is, even when R is simple, this operation is going to be expensive. We defined R being simple if this problem is easy to solve with the Euclidean norm. Once you change the norm, it's almost never easy to solve. I think we have like one case where we can solve it, um, and that relies on H being a diagonal plus rank one matrix. And other than that, you know, if, if H is rank two, or that, that algorithm like increases exponentially with the dimensionality, so it's not uh, not nice with the rank. But there's a nice solution. I mentioned we can start to do approximate operators. So why don't we just solve this problem um, approximately? Let's just find a really cheap uh, approximate solution to that problem. So this is what I showed before. We have our gradient projection algorithm, and we're going to try and make a better step using this approach. So you put down your function q, and you might start by doing the gradient projection step on q. So instead of taking the gradient of f, we're taking the gradient of our approximate function q and projecting that. So, so far we haven't done anything, but what we're going to do now is we're going to take another gradient descent step with respect to q, and we're going to keep iterating on q and not f. So q is going to be our chief approximation. Then in the end, our step is going to be the step to, the, to what is the approximate minimizer of q as opposed to just the gradient step. So we called that a, a proximal quasi-Newton algorithm. So there's a, an outer iter iteration and an inner iteration. The outer iteration evaluates the function and the expensive gradient, and it's going to use LVFGS to approximate the Hessian. Uh, the inner iteration is going to use a variant of proximal gradient called the spectral proximal gradient. And the spectral proximal gradient needs two things. It needs proximal operator of R in the Euclidean norm, so this is very cheap because we said it's for simple constraints. And it's going to need multiplication by h. And for LBFGS, you can actually do that in linear time. It's, um, it's not as well known as the recursive formula. Usually you multiply by h to the negative 1, but you can also do h with some linear algebra. Nice property is, as long as your, your step size is small enough, you actually only have to do one inner iteration to guarantee that you're making progress on the, the iteration. So as long as you do one iter inner iteration of this, you won't run into the problem I showed on the previous slide. Uh, but usually you'll do, uh, I think in my code it's like 10 is the default or something like that. So you try and do 10 iterations to improve. And the key thing here is you're going to do these cheap inner iterations so that you can avoid doing the expensive outer iterations. So that instead of evaluating your function thousands of times, you evaluate it 50 times or something like that. Um, so we called it optimizing costly functions with simple constraints when we did the constrained case. And then the, uh, the proximal case, maybe like optimizing costly functions with simple regularizers might be appropriate. And I think this really shows up a lot in machine learning. Um, another numerical result, this was for um, Gaussian graphical, fitting Gaussian graphical models. Um, so this was from 2009, I think this paper was published. But the, the, the current methods use this proximal Newton or projected quasi projected Newton idea with a few more tricks. So the, the current state of the art is still based on the same ideas. So at the time, the regular projected gradient was state of the art. And this is working with a dual, so we actually maximize. Um, if you just do the spectral projected gradient on its own, it works kind of similar, slightly better. And then this, this, this red is the projected quasi Newton. And it sort of finishes before these methods are really even getting off the ground. So, You'll probably be waiting a long time before the green line actually stops and, finished, stops and finishes because it slows down quite a bit. Okay, so moving on from proximal methods, another method that you might have heard about a lot lately is alternating direction method of multipliers. So in general, 
it's for problems of this form. We have some F, some R. I don't believe that either one has to actually be smooth, but it, it's nicer if F is smooth. And you have linear constraints um, tying those two functions together. And the ADMM roughly alternates between prox-like operators with respect to F and with respect to R. Um, and there, there are variations where you, where you can linearize one. Um, why is that relevant to the problems that came before? Uh, well, if I have a problem that looks like min of f of ax, so logistic regression, least squares, things like that, and so on, plus a regularizer, I can introduce a constraint to turn it into, into this form. So I, I make some new variables y with the constraint x equals ay, and then I minimize f of x plus r of y. So I've introduced constraints to get it into that form. Um, you, you can equivalently have a matrix on the other side, too. Um, and then these ADMM methods, they have advantages and disadvantages. So th they do get nice convergence rates, as, um, as I've shown before. They, they actually are, are much older than proximal gradient methods, and the, a lot of theory was done for them in the 70s. Um, but there, there's also a parameter involved that can sometimes be hard to set. Um, and if you can't compute the procs exactly, there's also something called linearized ADMM, which also has some nice properties and has got a lot of attention lately. Um, another strategy is, if you have a non-smooth problem, but it's strongly convex, there's something very nice you can do. And it uses the property that a strongly convex problem all, always has a smooth dual problem. Um, so in that case, it might make sense to solve the dual instead of the primal, because the smooth problems are generally easier than uh, non-smooth problems. So if we consider the case of SVMs, written in this form, if I take the dual, I get something that looks like this. So my parameters are alpha. I have upper and lower bound constraints, but as I said before, bound constraints aren't really scary. They're simple. Um, this is a quadratic function, and this is just a linear function. So it's actually an extremely simple dual function, even though the, the primal was kind of a non-smooth mess. So it's a smooth bound constraint problem. Uh, you can do two metric projection algorithms on that, or as I'll mention in the next section, you can also do randomized coordinate descent. And that's basically more or less the state of the art SVM solvers right now, is you go to the dual and you do, randomized coordinate descent has got a lot more attention lately, but um, there are other methods coming up the pipeline. Okay, so to finish off this section, I sort of highlighted some high level ideas of using structure in the objectives. Um, but if you really want to squeeze out every last bit of performance, there's, there's sort of three issues that I'm not, I don't want to talk about too much in detail. So if you're doing L1 regularization or, or SVMs in the dual too, there's this idea of shrinking, which is if you find a whole bunch of variables are likely to be zero in the solution, or you can prove that they're going to be zero in the solution, then just remove them from the problem and then you've got an easier, smaller problem to solve. You can also do continuation, where you start with a large value of the regularization parameter lambda and slowly decrease it. So in the case of L1 regularization, you, you start with a huge value of lambda, you solve the problem over the subspace uh, corresponding to this small set of non-zero variables, and you slowly increase lambda and make the problem size bigger over time. And, and in some cases, you can show that that has nice properties. And I'll briefly mention on the next slide is Frank Wolf, and that, that's for when you can't afford to do the proximal operator. So that was our, uh, that's our projected gradient step. It's minimizing this quadratic function over our convex set. Uh, but the problem is that can be hard to compute. So the, the problem that we really recently looked at where this was the case is the max margin markup networks. So it's a generalization of SVM where you're predicting objects instead of single plus one minus one variables. And there you, you just can't compute the, the projection operator in the dual. Um, there's so what we looked at instead is what's called the Frank-Wolf method. So this is the, our usual term, our linear approximation, and we've just gotten rid of the quadratic form, and we're minimizing over the whole set. So one thing that's immediately problematic is this may have no solution. Um, so usually you require that the set C is a compact set, meaning it, 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 you know, uh, it has bound, it's bounded in every direction. Uh, and you can write this step as a convex combination of x and x plus. Um, so, yeah, in general, this problem is going to be easier to solve than that. 
And in particular, um, in, th in that case, for chain structure data, actually solving this problem is equivalent to the Viterbi decoding algorithm. So you can just solve it with dynamic programming for max margin Markov networks, whereas we don't really know how to solve that problem. So for some problems, it's nice. Um, and this convex combination property is nice because what it'll tend to do if, for example, you're optimizing on the simplex is the solution to this problem will tend to just pick one vertex of the simplex. So you get this sparse representation of your parameter vector, which can be useful for some high dimensional settings. I know this is used a lot for solving um, uh, problems with matrix constraints because the solutions of this thing tend to just be rank one matrices. So you can write your thing as a sum of rank one matrices, which is very nice. Um, you can get the O of 1 over T rate for smooth convex objectives, and th there are some linear convergence rates now in the strongly convex case, but I'm not as familiar with, with that literature. Um, what if you don't like these quadratic or linear surrogates? What if you don't think your function is well approximated by a linear function or a quadratic function? Uh, there's something called mirror descent, where you replace that, that Euclidean norm squared or the quadratic norm squared by what's called a Bregman divergence. And Bregman divergence are, are functions that um, have a lot of nice properties, but the basic idea is they try and generalize this norm squared or norm of difference squared. So if you get the gradient method in this case, the Newton's method is under a general quadratic norm. And another interesting case that comes up is this, um, what's called the generalized kullback leadler divergence, and that leads to something called exponentiated gradient. So this is sometimes used for optimizing over the simplex. If, if you just have probability simplex constraints, people sometimes use this. Although you could also use projected gradient in that case. Uh, another interesting framework is called surrogate optimization, where you know all of these are some special cases of the, this very general framework where I'm minimizing some g of y that's approximation to f and just setting x plus to the argument of that. Um, so uh, Julien Mayral from Grenoble looked at the case where this g satisfies just a few simple properties. So g is an upper bound on f everywhere. They're equal at the current x. The gradient is equal at the current x. And the difference between the functions is actually a Lipschitz continuous function. And then he showed that if you have these sort of somewhat restrictive properties, you actually get those same convergence rates I've been talking about or something very similar to them in, in this general framework. Um, so this lets you analyze like some, some versions of expectation maximi maximization or at least algorithms that look like that and a whole bunch of other things including all of these things. So I think that's an interesting work. Uh, and there's probably more to be said there too. Okay, so I kind of, I'm done exploring all the non-smooth problem structures. Um, as I said, that stuff is not really in textbooks yet, but I think if you really want to fit non-smooth problems, these are the approaches you kind of need to know about. And I wish I had a better punchline than giving you a laundry list of algorithms. I think that that's, gonna, that's coming. Someone's gonna eventually make something like CVX will actually try and decompose your problem and find out the right algorithm to use but it's not really there yet. So if you have the, some of these non-smooth problems or saddle points or whatever constrained, then you're kind of stuck with that laundry list of things right now. So maybe optimization people need to do better. But uh, to move on to the next part of the talk, I'm gonna look at much more specialized classes of problems. And the motivation for this is actually um, problems where it's not really the structure of your objective, it's just the fact that you have a ton of data that's causing you problems. So I'm going to look at one of the simplest um, sort of abstractions of machine learning things you can think of. I want to minimize the average of a finite set of smooth functions. So you can, and I'm thinking about cases where n is very large. And that, that's sort of the difference is, you know, minimizing a smooth function, a lot has been said, but when n is very large, there's still a few more things to be said. And that, that's really been true in the last few years. So, the simplest example you might think of is least squares. So each of these fi of x is just the squared error for a data point, but you can do logistic regression, CRFs, smooth SVMs, all that, all that stuff. So I talked in the first part of the talk about deterministic gradient methods. Um, for this problem, same, same thing as before. I'm, I'm putting t there because I'm going to need that. So x T, t is just my iteration number, and I'm taking step size times the gradient, which for this problem structure is just the average of the gradients. 
So the issue is that the iteration cost is linear in n. I have to compute all of these n gradient values and then take their average. So if n is in the billions or trillions, this is not very appealing. I, I may not be able to do many iterations of this algorithm. So we know it doesn't take too many because it has linear convergence rate, but it's still, you may not be able to afford to do like 100 iterations or something like that. And you can do your quasi-Newton methods and all the tricks I talked about, but they're not really getting around this dependence on n. So uh, usually the approach in machine learning is we use stochastic gradient methods. So instead of looking at all data points, we randomly select one particular data point, uh, i, at iteration t, from our set 1 to n, and we're just going to take a gradient step on that one single training example. And this has um, advantages and disadvantages. So first thing you see is that if I actually take the, the expectation of what this term is with respect to i t, it's actually just ends up being the average of the gradient, so it's the gradient itself. So on average, this is taking a gradient step. And because I'm only looking at one guy on each iteration, the iteration cost actually doesn't depend on the number of training examples n. So if I have a billion examples, the same, it's the same cost as if I have one example. So that's really nice if you have a huge number of data points. But as in subgradient methods, you're actually going to need the step size to go to zero. And um, similar to subgradient, um, you're going to need uh, O of 1 over T. Um, and I, that, that's basically going to get you into the sublinear convergence regime. So that was our deterministic gradient method, where we're always going inside the circle and making nice steady progress. Whereas the stochastic gradient method, you're not always going orthogonal. You might take some weird steps, and you start out taking very large steps, but slowly your step sizes get smaller, and on average you, you converge to the solution. So the stochastic iterations are n times faster, but of course it matters how many iterations you need. Um, so here we're going to put the, the number of iterations needed by the exact method, and here's the number of iterations needed by the, the stochastic method. And so the first thing we look at is the non-smooth case where we're doing the subgrading algorithm. And this case looks great. Right? This is beautiful. I want you to take away this punchline today. If you're in the non-smooth case and you're using a general black box non-smooth solver, use the stochastic method. This convergence rate is in expectation, but you can prove, you know, you can start to prove high probability balance, things like that if you want, but the rates are the same. So the exact one that goes through your entire data set on each iteration takes the same number of iterations up to some O factor as the algorithm that looks at one data point at each iteration. I think that's, that's a huge win. So this is, this is good news. Stochastic is as fast as deterministic. You can solve your problems n times faster. Um, for smooth problems, it's less clear. So in fact, when we go from non-smooth to smooth in the exact case, uh, we, we talked about in the, first, the, the, the last part of the talk that you get a faster rate. The problem is the stochastic methods don't actually get faster when you go to the smooth case. So in some sense, the fact that you're differentiable doesn't help them at all. So it's not as clear whether you should be using the stochastic or the deterministic method in this case. And we, we can plot these as, as, our, you know, as this cartoon, where the deterministic method, the full gradient method, does absolutely nothing for n steps. It computes n gradient values, then it finally takes a big step. Then it does nothing. It's computing this big average, takes a big step. Computes a big average, takes a big step. But it, it's making steady progress. The stochastic method, Every time you compute a gradient, it takes a step. So it makes a mad amount of progress at the start, but it has sublinear rates, so the longer you run it, the less progress it makes. And now you don't know which algorithm to use. So in the non-smooth case, you should just use the stochastic algorithm. There's no reason to use the deterministic method. In this case, it's not so clear. If you're really time limited, if you can only have this much time, you can make the stochastic algorithm look really good. Whereas if you have this much time, then there's no point in using the stochastic algorithm. It'll take forever to, uh, or it will be quite different. Similarly, if you can show that your optimal test error happens at an optimization level around here, then just use the stochastic method because any further optimization isn't helping you from like a learning perspective. But if your optimal is, is down here, then the stochastic method might take forever to actually catch up. So it's, it's not as clear in the this, in this smooth case. So 
there's a lot of ways you can think of trying to speed up stochastic gradient methods. And if you just came to the, the first part of the talk, the first thing you would think of doing is let's do an accelerated version or a Newton-like version. Um, but actually, those don't improve the convergence rate either. Those, in some sense, they're relying on smoothness assumptions again, and it just doesn't show up. You still get a variance term that, that doesn't um, improve. But if your noise is small, or if you're at the very start when everything is a good direction, those can, those can still help in practice. But uh, asymptotically, they're not going to help. Two ideas that do help the convergence, at least in terms of constants, are averaging and large step sizes. So um, Francis and Eric Moulin showed that um, if you take a step size that looks like 1 over t to the alpha for this range, um, you still get the same convergence rate, but it's much more robust than if you, you took the classical step sizes. Uh, Nesterov showed that if you use gradient averaging, uh, that actually improves the constants, even though it doesn't improve the rate itself. And, and that, that actually works much better in practice. Um, if you average just the later iterations and you're smooth, you can improve the, uh, you can get rid of like a log factor. Um, there was an interesting result in the um, late 80s and early 90s, which is that there were previously results on what is like the, on, on Newton-like methods. So if, if, if you can get some estimator that's converging to the true Hessian and use that, there was some argument that you can improve the constant, and the constant depends on the Fisher information matrix uh, and so on. But in the late 80s and 90s, so that was work from like the 60s, it was shown that if you just take the average of the iterations, then you can achieve the same rate as the optimal Newton's method. And I almost view this as like a negative result, and that the, the, the result we have showing that Newton's method is faster in the stochastic case can be achieved by just averaging the iterations together. So it almost says that maybe stochastic Newton methods are not the, um, not the way to be looking. You can also just give up on convergence. You can say, I'm going to recognize that I'm not going to solve my problem perfectly, but I want to get a good solution fast. If you're in that regime, you should use a constant step size. Uh, you can show that you get a convergence rate that looks like O of rho to the t, so something that looks like linear convergence, and O of alpha. So this term is kind of weird. It's not like the other terms I've shown you because there's no t here. So this term never goes to zero, but it's proportional to the step size. So you, you very quickly forget your initial conditions, but then you, you never really solve the problem. So that's a, that's a very practical thing. And I think that's what a lot of people actually do or try to approximate. And then a, a very recent result was that um, even if you're not strongly convex, but you're smooth, uh, Bach and Moulin showed that um, for least squares, you can use averaging and big step sizes, or rather a constant step size to get a 1 over t rate. And then they gave sort of a, a weird Newton-like method that lets you do that for functions satisfying some sort of self-concordance property. So this was, this kind of came out of nowhere, that Newton's method seems to help you uh, when you're not strongly convex, because usually you only talk about Newton's method in terms of um, strongly convex problems. Okay, so those are sort of the, the practical tricks that are out there. That, are, that have some theoretical justification for making stochastic gradient work better. And these two tricks do actually work in practice, too, the averaging and the large step sizes. But the question is, maybe there's a, there's a better method in the, case, in the case of finite data. So if you, have in, if you have infinite data, you're just stuck with the stochastic algorithm. In finite data, maybe there's some hybrid algorithm that's out there that maybe, maybe starts out fast, but then slowly keeps getting the linear convergence rate, keeps making progress. So that Instead of having to choose between one of these two algorithms, we just have one algorithm that we should use all the time. And this has kind of been like a, a big motivator in my research the last uh, five years. So it comes from the question, should we use stochastic methods for smooth problems? And I would say the answer is yes. If we can have a linear convergence rate, but have something like one gradient evaluation per iteration. So there's a whole bunch of things you can think of to try and make this red line. And, um, you know, for example, you could do one iteration of the stochastic method and then switch to the deterministic method, something like that. Or you can gradually switch between them, things like that. Uh, the method I'm going to get to actually is a bit more exciting than that. Okay, so the answer to this is yes. Uh, it's a very simple algorithm called the stochastic average gradient algorithm. As in stochastic gradient methods, we randomly select one of our training examples and we compute the gradient with respect to that training example. 
We're going to take a step that looks like the gradient step, except for we can't really compute the gradient step because we don't have all the gradients. We only have the gradient for our one most recent example. So what we're going to do is we're going to store the gradients as we go. And I'm going to replace each of those gradients by the gradient with respect to that training example on the last iteration where I computed it. So it seems like a very practical thing you would do um, to approximate the gradient algorithm. Uh, it was first done in, in 2007, and we, we did a, a randomized version of it and had a nicer convergence rate. But it's actually surprising that this hadn't seemed to have been tried until 2007, because actually it works really well, as I'll show in a moment. So 2007 was Blatt et al. who did the cyclic one, and they, sh they showed the very surprising result that it has a linear convergence rate in terms of passes through the data. Um, and then our contribution was we showed that actually when you do the, the stochastic version, you get a linear convergence rate in terms of number of examples you've processed. So what's going on here? Roughly, we're assuming that the gradients of the examples that you don't select are not changing. You're saying that that old gradient, I'm still going to use it, and if it hasn't changed too much, it's probably still going to do something similar to the full gradient method. But the algorithm does converge. You can show that xt plus 1 minus xt, that's going to 0. The iterations are getting closer and closer together. So as you, you have these old gradients, your iteration, the, the, the time it took, or the distance you've traveled since you compute that old gradient, it's getting smaller over time. And it just happens to be that, the, the, that everything sort of works out in a very hideous proof to show that everything comes together at the same rate. Now, it might look a little scary because um, I'm actually telling you you have to store all the gradients, and I said that n was very large. Um, if you're doing thing, li what's called uh, linearly parameterized models, like least squares, logistic regression, and stuff, you only have to store one value per training example, so the memory is only O of n. Um, and for other problems, there's, there's um, newer algorithms that get rid of that issue. So first, I just want to look at the convergence rate. So we know, have to not only look at the rate, but actually the number of gradients each iteration computes. So stochastic gradient gets a 1 over t with only one gradient, and deterministic gets the faster rate, but it has n gradients per iteration. Um, so SAG, um, and I'm just doing the strongly convex case, because that's the more interesting case to me, um, gets a rate that looks like this monster. And we first saw that, and we thought it was kind of weird, because you've got n showing up, and the mu over l, things like that. But this is a linear convergence rate, and there, there's just one gradient per iteration. So it's very nice. Um, now, it's li instead of l, because you need to do the, it's the l for the individual terms. So you have to find one L that works for all the terms. And in general, that might be much bigger than an L that works for the average. So the, the L is not quite the same. But up, up to that issue and this, this min issue, the SAG method has roughly the same speed as the, the method that looks at the entire data set on each iteration. So I, I think that's really interesting. Um, so that was work from 2012. And it's actually been extended in a whole bunch of interesting ways. So it was shown that if, you, if your problem is um, smooth and strongly convex and you go to the dual um, and apply dual coordinate ascent, um, you can actually get sort of a similar rate with, with just dual coordinate ascent. Um, there's also methods that get rid of the memory. Um, and those are very cool. And, and you can ask Jacob, because he wrote one of those papers about that issue. Um, there's variants which, which have the proximal operator or that use ADMM. So, so all the stuff from the, the third part of the talk has more or less been done or is in the progress of being done in this sort of large n case. Uh, there's ways to improve the constants. And another interesting thing is actually try, instead of picking the example randomly, trying to cleverly pick which example you should choose to update. And, and that gives you a better, basically, instead of finding an li that, that works for all the functions, you can find an l that works on average for all the functions, uh, and w which can be much smaller, because average is smaller than max. So I want to show uh, a, a picture of how this performs, because this is like one of the most surprising moments of my research life, is once we started applying this and comparing it to things, we realized that it actually works really well. So we tried to like compare it to better and better things, and it kept beating everything. So I'll show you what's in the picture here. So IAG, that's the cyclic version of the algorithm, the version of the algorithm that came before that had the, the weird, interesting result. AFG is Nesterov's accelerated gradient method. LBFGS is a quasi-Newton method. 
So those are the deterministic methods. They start out very slow, but they might eventually make progress and they might eventually pass the stochastic methods. Now this is stochastic gradient and average stochastic gradient where we've used a huge step size and I've actually searched for the step size that gives the best performance. So it actually runs all the step sizes and then just picks the best one. So it's completely cheating. I think it's, but I think that's a, a fair baseline. And we've compared to Adagrad and to um, the optimal stochastic gradient method and all the other fancy things, momentum. Um, this is where the new method uh, shows up. And we were just like surprised. We thought there was a bug or something like this. So it starts out fast like the stochastic methods and then it sort of keeps going. And the, the slope is even nicer than the, uh, the other deterministic method. So, so here, it's actually done like 30 passes through the data and it's actually this point disappears because it actually goes below what I estimated to be the optimal function value. Um, so that's why that point drops off. And then obviously this is, you know, 10 to the minus 15 is numerical accuracy. So I think this is, R RCV1 I don't really like, but it is kind of cool that you do 10 passes through the data and you're below, you've got five digits of accuracy already. So moving on from stochastic methods, uh, the second randomized algorithm I want to talk about is uh, coordinate descent methods, which are making a fierce, fierce comeback right now. Um, they're really, if you're thinking about problems, in one of these two forms. I have min of f of ax, uh, where f is cheap and smooth, and then I can have a non-smooth but separable function. So this can be something like least squares, this can be something like L1 regularization. Alternately, I can have um, a function defined on a graph, G. So I have some function defi defined on each node of the graph on each, and on each edge of the graph. So that shows up in, uh, in graph-based semi-supervised learning. <coughs> so an appealing strategy for those two problems is actually the classic old school coordinate descent method. So instead of doing our standard gradient descent, we're gonna pick some coordinate J and we're just gonna do our gradient step or a line search along that particular coordinate. We're just gonna update one variable at a time. Um, in the graph thing, it's very clear why that might be a good idea because you just update this function and you just have to look at each of its neighbors to compute the gradient. So you're just operating locally on the graph. Um, here it's because of the AX sort of has a nice structure where it makes sense to do that in this case. And you can often do a, a cheap and very accurate line search if you're just doing one, one dimensional optimization. So one, one dimensional optimization is much easier than high dimensional. So one thing you could think of doing is let's find the best coordinate to update. Um, so under some definition, the best coordinate to update is the one with the biggest uh, gradient magnitude. This is the one with the steepest slope. So locally, it looks like the one that makes the most progress. Um, in some special cases, you can actually compute that. In general, you, you can't compute that uh, for those two problem classes. Um, if you can do that though, you get a convergence rate that, that looks like this. So you get one minus mu over L, which we always sort of have, but now it's LJ because you need some L that works for all the coordinates. And LJ is actually a nice, it, it, it's smaller than the big L. And then D is the number of coordinates. So you, you sort of lose that, but um, the, the punchline here, okay, so LJ is much smaller. The punchline is that if you can do d steps of coordinate descent for the cost of one gradient step, because the LJ is smaller, it will be faster. And that's why I say it's really for those two problems, because those are basically the only two problems I know, other than small generalizations of them, where this, this property is true. But those two problems cover a lot of the things we care about in machine learning. They do not cover neural networks. There, it's not obvious to me at all that coordinate descent applies to that case, but most other things, you can do coordinate descent. And it's really relying on this property, that you can update all the variables in the cost, roughly the same cost as up doing one gradient step. Uh, the interesting result shown by Nesterov was that if instead of picking the best coordinate, you just pick a random coordinate, um, you can get this exact same rate uh, in expectation, which, which was very surprised. And it's again, this um, that randomization seems to really help with the, uh, the scaling issue. Um, now one thing I'll mention is that we have, we have a, a workshop paper we present at NIPS showing that actually it's not really the same rate because the greedy method is actually probably faster than this for almost all problems you'll encounter, but um, it makes a nicer story if I ignore the most recent work. 
Um, okay, so there's been a whole bunch of extensions. So in coordinate descent, uh, they've also, you know, there, that's where one of the places where Lipschitz sampling first showed up. Um, you can do your projection, you can do your proximal operators. Uh, there's also Frank Wolf version if your constraints, uh, if you have, you know, you do block coordinate descent and each block has a simplex constraint or something like that. It makes sense. Uh, and there's a, there's a nice accelerated versions too. So the first, the, the Nestrov's original accelerated version actually violated this rule. Uh, but the more recent accelerated versions actually um, still let you do the coordinate descent faster. So the last randomized algorithm I want to talk about is for problems of this form or problems where there's some f of ax somewhere in the objective and the bottleneck is actually the matrix multiplication. It's multiplying by a um, and you're assuming a is actually low rank. So there's these randomized linear algebra approaches which are quite cute. Uh, roughly, you estimate this orthogonal matrix Q, this, which is kind of going to try and be a, more or less a, 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 you know, a basis for what A does. So you approximate A by Q, Q transpose A. So that, you, know, you compute this once in your life, and now you, can, uh, now you start working with Q instead of A. So it uses the low rank structure. So now you parameterize your function in terms of that. I guess there should be an X there. The point is you multiply a times x once and then you work with, with the, with the um, or sorry, you multiply those things once and you work with them. So Q is formed from uh, Gram-Schmidt and the usual approach is actually multiplying it by uh, a by random vectors and then doing the orthogonalization. Um, you can show this gives very nice approximation bounds if the singular values decay quickly. So if, if you, the singular values your matrix A go to zero very quickly, then you can show that you only need a few random matrix multiplications to approximate A very well, and then you just solve this modified problem, which is basically working in a lower dimensional space. Um, the issue with that is, um, this is very exciting for um, like compressed sensing people where they have very specialized structured matrices. It's not as clear to me that this is important for machine learning when, when, when A is like a, the data set you've gotten from a real process because the, the matrices A we get are often not low rank. So you have to actually think about whether this makes sense or not. Um, and it, it can actually work quite badly if that's not true. Okay, so moving on to the last section is sort of, sort of the non-smooth optimization was maybe like the past 10 to 15 years, the exciting things. The randomized algorithm has really been the last five years and real more, more of the stuff has been done in the last two or three years. And this is talking about moving forward. What are the exciting things coming up the pipeline? So two recent trends computation in general is our serial computation speed is not really going up that fast. So when I was, you know, in high school, junior high, undergrad, you know, you buy a new computer every four years and it's like four or five times faster. It's great. You know, you just buy a new computer and suddenly everything's faster. Um, the computer I have right now is the same speed as the computer I bought like 10 years ago. It's like 64-bit, it's got more clever vectorization, it's got a bunch of other tricks, but the clock speed hasn't improved. Um, data sets also are not really fitting on a single machine. So it's either that they, they don't fit in RAM or that they actually just do, don't fit on one hard drive. You have to spread them across multiple hard drives. Um, so the conclusion of this is we really need to start thinking about parallel and distributed computation models. We need to think about using more than one processor at a time we need to think about what happens if our data is not all in the same place. Uh, and two issues that I'll mention today are, are one is synchronization. So if your data is all over the place, you may not want to wait for the slowest machine to, to finish. And you may also have communication bottlenecks, which could also be a problem. But before I get into the fancy new methods that people propose, I want to remind people of something called embarrassingly parallel and that many machine learning problems are in fact embarrassingly parallel. So embarrassingly parallel is a somewhat technical term in the parallel algorithms community, meaning it's a problem you can basically split up across M machines, you do something on all M machines, and you do a simple operation to combine the results. Uh, you get a nearly linear speed up, which, which is optimal. Um, so as, as it said right there. So the example, the, the one I used from the last section, is if you need to compute a gradient for a huge number of training examples, well, I'll just split, take the first chunk of my data on one machine or one, one processor, the second on another processor, and so on. Split it across M things. They all do their thing independently, combine them together, and go. 
So in theory, those allow linear speed ups, which are optimal, and you should always just consider that first. Um, and maybe, maybe I'll pause on this point a little bit longer, because there are a lot of new algorithms and things coming out, but you should never forget that this is in some sense like, if you can do the embarrassingly parallel thing, that's the optimal strategy. Okay, so let's talk about the asynchronous issue. Do we have to wait for the last computer to finish? So let's say we're in that framework, and I didn't, um, some of the gradients take longer to compute than others. And so we've got one computer that's just chugging along. It's really slow. All the other ones are done, and now we're just waiting for this slowest one. Um, do we have to wait for that one? And, and no, uh, you can think of doing things asynchronously where, where you're not waiting. Um, so if you think of doing stochastic gradient on your laptop, which probably has like four to 16 cores on it, um, what you can do is just have one laptop co compute, one core compute a gradient, and just apply the gradient update, and they all do this independently, and they don't wait for each other. And you can think of that as a gradient method where you have just a delayed gradient. So they're all sharing the same XK, then your gradient might be from, an old, from a processor that hasn't been, uh, has an old version of XK. To make that work, you need to decrease the step size in proportion to how, how, how asynchronous you are. But the convergence rate actually decays pretty elegantly with how delayed you are. So I think this is, this is a really nice thing for parallelizing. Another thing you can do is think of, if you don't want to pass gradient vectors around, you can just do coordinate descent, and then you pass individual coordinates around. So instead of updating one coordinate at a time, I'm going to optimate, optimize, or update, let's say, three coordinates at a time, and just do them all independently. Um, and that way, to pass things around, in principle, I only need to pass around single coordinates or possibly other information needed to update uh, gradients or function values. Um, you again need to decrease the step size a little bit for convergence. And um, if you start drawing a, a graph between um, sort of the, that's, that's maybe a bit out of context, but if you draw a graph reflecting which gradients depend on each other, and that graph is, ex is extremely sparse, you can get quite a speed up. Whereas if it's dense, then you may have to decrease the step size a lot. Um, another thing that I thought was quite interesting is the, the decentralized gradient method. So this is where you actually need to distribute the data across machines. Um, and you don't really have a central parameterized vector because you have some communication constraints. So not every machine can talk to each other machine equally fast. Um, so so, so the, the decentralized gradient method was proposed for this case. So here each processor has its own data samples and data is not being transferred across the network. And each processor is all, also going to have its own parameter vector. So this kind of has like a memory, like the SAG type algorithms. Um, and each processor is only going to, can, going to communicate with a limited number of neighbors. So here's the step you do. Let's ignore this part for, this, for the moment. We've got our new iteration is the average over the, the gradient average over the data that you have. But instead of going from your previous iteration x, you're going to take the average iterate among your neighbors and take a step on that. So you take the average guess of what the optimal solution is from your neighbor, then you use your own data to correct that, and now you're going to send your solution to your neighbors to update them. If all neighbors talk to each other, this is just equivalent to gradient descent, because this thing will be the, the true um, gradient for everybody, and then you'll be applying the, the, all the gradient things to that. Um, but otherwise, it, it depends on what the, the graph Laplacian of your connection network. Um, and it actually, um, the, the convergence rate decays fairly gracefully in terms of how you lose connections. So, and the, the convergence rate is, is nice and fast, whereas some of the earlier distributed methods did not have, uh, you know, you didn't have linear convergence rate in a setting where you should have a linear convergence rate because you always have, to have the uh, embarrassingly parallel option. Uh, and there's also some cute stuff looking at what if you have communication failures or machine failures? What if something goes wrong? Can we be robust to that? And there's some work done in that area too. Okay, so I'm going to finish a little early, but I first want to uh, give a summary. So maybe you have a, a take home message if some of the parts of the talk were not clear. I'm sure that um, many of the parts of the talk were possibly not clear, but maybe you got some general ideas. But let's talk about some take home messages. Okay. So convex functions have special properties that allow us to efficiently minimize them. In fact, they're one of the only continuous functions that have properties that let us efficiently minimize them. Gradient-based methods, they're going to let us scale to large dimensional problems. If you have many, many variables, gradient methods scale very well. 
Part three talked about non-smooth methods, and there's things like proximal gradient methods, Frank Wolf, smoothing, things like that. They're going to work much better than the black box non-smooth solver. So in some sense, this is bad news. It means you're probably going to have to actually think about how to write a non-smooth solver for your particular problem. You may have to learn a bit of optimization, more so than you want to, and this is also part of the reason why machine learning people have had to learn a lot more optimization in the last few years. It's because we want to solve non-smooth problems. Part four talked about randomization, when we just have huge data sets and how randomization can be a nice tool for that. And coordinate descent and stochastic gradient methods are kind of the two, uh, the two uh, main methods we use. And then part five was just talking, you know, somewhat um, abstractly about the future, which is really gonna have to think about parallel and distributed systems, where if we wanna solve really big problems, we need to start thinking about these actually issues that have been traditionally associated with systems. So similar to machine learning people falling in love with um, optimization people in the last few years, uh, we're gonna have to start being more friendly to system people now because those are the issues that are really coming up. So finally, thank you for coming and staying till the end and thank you for inviting me out here. I'm looking forward to enjoying Sydney and having beers with all of you for the next few days. Um, bonus slide. <laughs> you thought you were done. Okay, I need to say something about the non-convex case because actually we're starting to say something about the non-convex case in the last few years. So one thing, completely out of left field, this is not the only reference, but it's, it's one of the references, and these papers are not very nice to read at all. If you have a non-convex function, you can show that the norm of the gradient actually is one over t for at least one iteration along your path. So you run your non-convex algorithm, your final step might be in some place where you're going down insanely quickly, but at some point in time you've got close to something that looks like a saddle point. And it has a convergence rate similar to, um, I mean this, this is also true for convex functions, but it, it's interesting that you can say this for non-convex problems. Another thing that's come out of the Bayesian optimization literature is, remember this convergence rate we had for grid search that I said was absolutely horrible? If your function is sufficiently smooth, there's been a relatively recent result showing that Bayesian optimization can actually improve your dependence on this one over D term here. So in some cases, Bayesian optimization can actually beat grid search and that extremely pessimistic bound I showed you near the beginning to motivate looking at convex functions, for some functions it's not as pessimistic as we thought. Okay, thank you. So um, are there any questions from the audience? intelligent comments except to say that there are entire books written on that subject and it is really important. There was a JMLR paper that was based on randomization where they reported amazing results and then a follow-up paper came out saying um, no we can't reproduce your results they're absolutely terrible. And then the follow-up paper by the original authors said that no there's a problem with the Linux random number generator if you use a different random number generator it works. <laughs> um, so you know up to making sure that it satisfies them. You know, it, it is very important, but I don't have anything more intelligent to say than use the best one you can find. Yep. Yeah. Ordered in what way? Um, you can definitely do the structured sparsity to do things like, um, let's say you, you, have a, you have a Markov chain and you don't want to know, you don't want, you don't know if you need a first or second or third or, or whatever order Markov chain. Uh, you can use structured sparsity to try and pick the order of the Markov chain to try and formulate that as a convex problem and do that. Is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? Uh, yes. So, yeah, so we, we can talk about that after. There's, there's a bunch of other things you can do. It's kind of an area that's not been fully explored yet. There's another question over there. Uh, yeah. yeah.
That is actually a very important question. Um, how do you pick the, the data sets you're comparing things on? Is that an accurate summary? Um, so something you see a lot in stats and also in the optimization literature is you randomly generate a data set, often from a Gaussian random matrix. And I admittedly did this in my ICML submission this year, but normally I hate it. Because the problem with generating a random Gaussian matrix is it's nearly orthogonal with high probability, uh, which means mu over L is close to one, which means the problem is super easy. So if you report results on something like that, it does not reflect what's gonna happen when you apply to a real data set. So in general, up to my running out of time a couple weeks ago, um, I try and find real data sets that either other people have used or that are freely available online, which lets you reproduce the results and that hopefully reflects what's gonna happen when people download your code and use it. Similarly, when I release a code, I, take, I try and find as many data sets as I find, like 20 to 30, find the parameters that work best across all data sets, and then try and release it and hope that that means it works well in your data set. It's kind of like the standard training testing regime in machine learning just applied to optimization. Um, we have plenty of time for more questions yet in the front. Um, yes, it is. <laughs> I have a very strong student who's working on proving that statement. So the Blatt et al. paper, the 2007 paper, they did not have convexity assumptions in their, their global convergence analysis. So we know that the cyclic version does actually converge for non-convex problems. Um, now, but, there's a subtle issue here, is that do you care about finding the global optimum or do you care about finding a local optimum quickly? Because if, if, if the local optimum look arbitrarily the same, then definitely. But if the local optimum are really different and uh, you, you really care about getting like the best global optimum, then you need to have some globalization strategy. In which case, SAG would need to be augmented by some way to make sure you're actually gonna find the global optimum genetic algorithms and all the fun stuff that we are kind of don't use right now, but it's probably going to be coming back in the next 10 years. But on the same line about SAG, uh, so do you have any idea about structure or what are the tricks that people did for reducing the history of the parameters? Yes. For the here cases, I think I understand about the other cases. Yeah, so for like least squares logistic regression, for anyone where you have f of a, trans a times x, um, you just need to store, usually it, it ends up being the residuals. The other tricks you can do are you use mini batches, where if you have, if you group things into, if you group 100 functions together into one function, then you reduce your memory by 100, things like that. Uh, and that, that's used by a, a lot of people. Um, and then the other thing is you just change the algorithm. So these, there's these things, they have, they have different names, they're like called mixed optimization or variance reduced stochastic gradient or semi-stochastic gradient. They're, all, they're kind of similar. And instead of updating the memory on each iteration, they occasionally stop, do a full pass through the data to compute the exact gradient, and then they use that uh, as their memory. And then they, they update the iteration a bit. And the nice thing about those is you only have to store one parameter vector. You have no gradients you have to store. So that just completely gets rid of the memory. It has similar theoretical properties too, so. Yep. Uh, yes. Um, so the, the idea behind all of them, so there's been a whole bunch of non-uniform sampling things come up. It, it first came up in linear systems, then it came up in coordinate descent, and then in stochastic gradient methods, and I believe I'm also forgetting another case. Um, but in all the cases, the idea is some of the gradients are going to change faster than others. So if you think about SAG and you want to know is this, out, if, is this gradient too out of date? Should I update it? Well, if I know that that gradient can change very quickly, then I need to update it quite often, otherwise it's gonna be a bad approximation. If that gradient can change very slowly, if I know that I can, I can go a long time, move very far away from it, and it's not gonna change very much, then I don't need to sample it very quickly. So the Lipschitz constants of the gradients tell you how quickly the gradients can change, and the idea is you bias your sampling towards the bigger Lipschitz constants. 
So the gradients that change very quickly, you sample them very often. And the ones that change very slowly, you don't sample them very often because you don't need to. <coughs> now, there's a difference between SAG and the classic stochastic gradient methods. So the classic stochastic gradient methods, the, it's less clear that there's a win by doing non-uniform sampling. Um, because you get, you get this variance term, which actually ends up being the dominant term, and it ends up being hurt by non-uniform sampling. Whereas SAG, you actually really directly change the convergence rate and make it go faster. So I think, I think there's, a, there's a slight difference. And, and coordinate descent is similar, where non-uniform sampling is just a clear win. Uh, I wish I had a better answer to this question. Uh, Bertikas actually visited us a few months ago, and someone asked him the same question. He, I seemed to, he came up with a very elegant answer, and I seemed to believe him at the time. But on thinking about it more, I still don't have a great answer for that question. Especially for SAG, we have no idea why the randomized version works so much better than the cyclic version. Because for regular stochastic gradient, it doesn't seem that there's a huge difference between those two. And for some of the RMs that have come out since then, some of the variants on SAG, you can do things not cyclically, but there's, there's a sort of small variations where you, you go through a random permutation, then you flip the random permutation and go through that. And this is better for you know, when you're actually running things on a computer um, because of memory access patterns. But I don't have great intuition. So in cyclic case, you can imagine an adversary that tries to give you like the worst order of examples and that makes your algorithm do like weird things. And the stochastic case would avoid that. But I still don't have a full intuition for why we see these big practical differences. Sorry. Yeah, I, I have a question here. So um, I'm wondering if um, someone has studied you know, what happens with the black box functions, for example, uh, when you don't know if it slips, it continues or not, and um, what the constants are. Um, can you start with some approximation and then start learning how your function is so that you can apply these efficient methodologies? Uh, yeah, that, that's actually a very important question. So if you don't know what the Lipschitz constant is, but you know that the function itself is Lipschitz continuous, so you know that there is some L out there, but you don't know what it is, uh, there's very nice ways to approximate L as you go. Um, especially in the deterministic case, they have a complete convergence theory. The stochastic case, they don't have the convergence theory, but they work really well in practice. But if you don't, if you don't know L, you can get a rough <laughs> estimate of an L that works as you're going. If you don't know whether or not your Lipschitz continuous, up, up to some degenerate cases, it's actually still OK to apply these algorithms. Because as long as your, your iterations stay in some like compact set, as long as you're not diverging out to infinity, you're probably still going to be Lipschitz in the area you're going to stay on. And so the results really only have to apply in some compact set that contains all your iterations. And some people even strictly project onto a compact set to take advantage of this in the, in the older stochastic gradient world. Um, so a lot of the things, I, there's, there's still like, you need to know whether it's smooth or not smooth. Yeah. Um, the Bach and Moulin's paper, the most recent one, is probably the only one I, I can think of that doesn't need to know like at least roughly what regime you were in. But a lot of the algorithms, they're, you know, they're adapted, they, you know, like SAG doesn't need to know if you're convex or strongly convex, it'll automatically pick out that one. Um, gradient descent, you know, you don't need to be, you only need to be Lipschitz along the lines that you're looking at and you don't even need to know L. So the short answer is a lot of the algorithms have some of this adaptivity, but there are some like, there are some cases where it's not there people are still trying to work on an algorithm that works in all settings. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I have one more question. Um, have you kind of studied any methods that combine global search with local search at the same time? Like, uh, I guess even it would work on parallel and distributed systems where you can have like maybe some system working on a global solution and then having local um, yeah. optimization it's processes, right? It's easier to do one thing at a time. <laughs> yeah, sure, yes, yeah. Um, but I guess you can improve the curve maybe or get practice, the practice you want to do that stuff. And I'm thinking of getting one of my more hacker students to actually look at this issue. But actually proving things about such things, I don't think we're quite, I don't think we're quite there yet. And the problem is, for the global rates, we just don't have a lot of tools. Like this bull paper involves a whole bunch of things that I'm not familiar with. 
I need to go like review my, or learn my functional analysis in the first place to start even making contributions here. So um, that will come, but there's, there's definitely no theory um, other than trivial statements yep. right now. Um, yep, there's some more questions. Any convex function. Okay, so to answer the first part is adding that regularizer definitely changes the solution in general. So, for example, in the original problem, the solution might have been unique, and you add this strongly convex regularizer, and now it's unique. So, it, and it may not even be part of the original solution. The hope is that it's small enough, and if you don't care about the exact maximum likelihood estimator, which you, you often don't, then it's probably not going to change it too much. It'll give you something that's probably more stable. Now, the second part of the question is, does, some, does the regularizer sometimes not change the solution? And that is actually true. Um, I'm not familiar with this work, but um, I did a postdoc with uh, Michael Friedlander, who's now at UC Davis, while I was waiting for my French visa to go work with Francis Bach in Paris. And he has done some interesting work with, with Paul Tseng um, on what he calls exact regularization or something like that. So he, he shows that there are certain conditions under which you can add a regularizer to a problem and the solution of the regularized problem is the same as the original problem. And then this is just a clear win. This is, the, this is like, if you're not saying there's no reason not to do the regularizer, because you make the problem easier and you get the same solution. But I don't know that literature. Look up Michael Friedlander and look up exact regularization. Th th it came up in, in like a compressed sensing type of context where they wanted to know if, uh, if they can add an L L2 to the L1 to make it easier. Okay, so um, let's thank the uh, speaker again. Thanks, Mike.